special thought and special attention to their circumstances, often quite dramatic as well. Uh, bleak figures, uh, a bleak outlook that uh, you've shared with us, uh, especially looking at the vulnerable groups. Um, I've sort of calculated that it's basically every seventh hour that has not been worked as compared to last year. And uh, that might sound uh, little, but of course it has a global impact. So how do we respond? Uh, how does the ILO respond? How do your constituents respond to this? Yeah, this is all important. Um, you know, the damage that this crisis does is not a fatality. It also depends on how we react to it. And at the ILO, we've been encouraging our member states, governments, employers and workers, basically to act on, on in four areas, four policy pillars, as we refer to them. The first, and it's perhaps the most obvious, is uh, we need to see, and we have seen governments uh, using all of the fiscal and monetary tools and space available to them, to stimulate economic activity, to help us all get through these terribly difficult circumstances. And uh, the total is that some 10 trillion US dollars has been spent worldwide on just this type of uh, stimulus uh, package. Then we need to focus in and, and target support to enterprises. We must make sure that viable enterprises do not become victims of this pandemic, that there will still be there uh, once we can get back to work. And we need also to focus upon support for jobs, for employment, uh, and for supporting income. Social protection is absolutely fundamental in combating this pandemic. The third pillar uh, is simply, and this is where the health aspect comes in most strongly, we have to protect working people, either those who have continued to work, the essential workers who've done such a heroic job uh, throughout the pandemic. I think of those 170 million frontline health and care workers in particular, we have to protect them. And we have to also make sure that those now returning to work are able to do so in absolutely uh, safe conditions. And lastly, and this is in the nature of the ILO's tripartite constituency, Connie, we need dialogue. We need to see cooperation between governments, employers and workers organizations to find the right, the practical solutions, the solutions that correspond to realities and actually work. And I've been encouraged uh, to see that many of our member states have been using that tool of social dialogue really very effectively. Well, thank you very much, Guy, uh, up to now. And uh, we're going to continue, but uh, let's just face it, uh, each region has sort of different uh, aspects uh, of challenges within the crisis. And um, you um, and the ILO hosted last week uh, this uh, beautiful pre-event of the Global Summit, uh, where we looked uh, at events uh, in Africa, in the Americas, in Asia, uh, in uh, the Arab states, of course, uh, and uh, in, in Europe. So um, I hope that you did have a little bit of time to actually watch uh, these events, which were sort of between three and four hours long, and showed um, the special challenges there. So what was your take uh, away from what you heard? Yeah, I think these, um, these pre-events, these, these regional events, Connie, were really very, very important. Firstly, because whilst we properly speak about a global crisis, each region is facing uh, specific conditions, specific challenges that we really do need to focus upon. So to have these regional events, to get close to the realities of each region was a great opportunity to hear uh, the messages of those who are really grappling with the challenges at first hand. And, and that's important because there are big uh, regional differences. We know that this pandemic has moved from one part uh, of the world to another uh, at different times and with different degrees of severity. We know that the pre-existing world of work challenges were quite different uh, in the different regions. And the, the pandemic didn't sort of imprint itself on a blank sheet of paper. There were pre-existing challenges. We know as well that institutions in different countries and different regions have different capacities, are developed in different ways. Uh, and finally, and it's a very important point, uh, we know that resources, the resources that the world has to combat this pandemic are very unevenly spread across the different regions and different countries. So we really do need to have these 
regional insights so that our global events of this week uh, can really uh, respond to the realities that people are dealing with. So I think that these events were really good. I, I did have a chance to look at them and I was really pleased by the way our constituents have mobilized and really interested as well by the messages that they convey to us. Director General Guy, thank you so much uh, for setting the scene uh, together with us, uh, so sort of laying out, let's say, the red carpet on which we will walk uh, the regions right now. Uh, we'll be seeing each other towards the end of this event, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to that, of course. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, um, with that, thank you again uh, to Geneva. Um, let's sort of uh, set the scene at what is going to happen uh, with the these five regions. Basically, we have a very similar pattern. Uh, we have prepared some kind of vox pops, like from people in the region, how they feel about it. We will be talking to the regional directors and then we will also have an excerpt of the events that we've been talking about uh, that were four hours that have been condensed to 20 minutes and uh, it is uh, of course that we are now starting with Asia Pacific. Um, last Thursday, uh, July the 2nd, the regional discussion in Asia Pacific took place and they were hosted in Bangkok. It brought together uh, the ILO constituents, that is governments, employers and workers from across the region. They convened to discuss the impact on COVID of COVID-19 on people in the region, how best to respond. And very soon I'll bring in the regional director for Asia and the Pacific, Ms. Uh, Tomoko Nishimoto. But let's first hear the voices of these people that I've been talking about that the ILO is trying to help. Luckily that we, our company do not have like um, the policy for layoff or like for the salary cut because of our owner, they are support. They have to reorganize some jobs and we try to like uh, training the staff, our staff to more like multitasking skills. So I think for future plan, we have to be ready for the unexpected situation like this again. เป็นโควิดสิบเก้านี่เขาก็ให้พักงานแล้วก็ลดงานด้วยค่ะทำงานสองวันหยุดวันหนึ่งค่ะหนูก็ไปมีพอค่ะทีนี้หนูก็มี
Tomoko Nishimoto, uh, the ILO Director, Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific. It's wonderful you can be with us uh, in the evening in Bangkok. Uh, now, these six people were, of course, just a tiny fraction of the population. What do you hear in Bangkok? What are the views that are mirrored uh, to you? What is uh, your understanding? Okay. Hello, Connie. Thank you for having me. Um, well, I wish um, I could say there are just exceptions, but unfortunately, you know, they, they do represent millions of people in this region who have been going through extremely difficult times. You know, often we cite numbers, for example, equivalent of 230 million full-time jobs lost these are not just numbers there are countless devastating human stories behind these numbers in fact i must say the reality is even worse um, as uh, you seen in the previous video with the dg in addition to those stories of losses of jobs incomes and livelihoods that uh, we have seen in our uh, video there are even more heartbreaking stories of domestic and workplace violence, serious illnesses, and even death. We are going through the extraordinary tough socioeconomic calamity as well as a serious health crisis. And you know, Connie, that the video also demonstrates one of the most uncomfortable facts that this crisis revealed, inequality the existing and ever worsening inequality in a region, those who can least afford to withstand any health or income shock are exactly those who are suffering from the most from the consequences of this crisis. The poor taxi or rickshaw driver you saw and a migrant worker in the video, they cannot afford to be out of work without work even if going to work means they would be exposed to a high risk of virus infection. The poor workers try to get through on the few hours of work that they can find or spending little savings if they have any savings at all or is, um, resorting to take out loans or even relying on the humanitarian aid or charity to survive and feed their families. They, repre they, they represent the working poor in this region. And the number of the working poor are going to surge as a result of this crisis, especially because in this region, more than two out of three workers are in the informal economy and they really have access to organized social protection benefits. Connie, it is also interesting to see one of the stories was about the entrepreneur who is trying to retain workers, the printer, but worried that he will not be able to do so, do so for much longer. You know, people in this region are known for their resilience, but we do worry about the, their, their capacity to continue to keep up with the adversity because unfortunately, the crisis is likely to be with us for much longer than initially hoped, Connie. That's the story from the region. Over to you. Thank you very much for sharing uh, that insight. And uh, it seems really a terrible dilemma to be faced with either work or uh, expose yourself to health risk, uh, not a choice um, that most of us would like to have to take. So how is the ILO and the world of work um, responding to these needs and uh, maybe soften the human impact of the pandemic? Yes, I must recognize that um, many governments in our region have tried to step up with assistance to protect workers and their families, as well as to support enterprises, particularly small enterprises and uh, employers. As for the ILO, we have been very active both at the national and regional levels, leveraging the roles of the constituents in policy dialogues and formulation ensuring the social partners have the capacity to uh, re respond 
and access to information that they need. The ILO has assisted in undertaking first impact assessment, particularly sectoral em uh, employment impact of the crisis, as a basis to develop policy measures for employment retention and wage subsidies, for example. And the most needed policy advice, I think pointed out by the DG, um, by our constituents, has been on how to strengthen their social protection programs. Our support includes broadening the coverage of both contributory and non-contributory benefit schemes. We have been very active in this uh, area as we want to take maximum advantage of the growing attention to the value in investing social protection floors. We do need to reach out the vulnerable who are not covered by the current uh, systems. We also put forth a wide array of practical tools and guidelines from business continuity plans to OSH guidelines on return to work at the enterprise level in both formal and informal sectors. We support the promotion of the sustainable enterprises, large enterprises restructuring seems inevitable, and, I have, and, and we have actively promoted social dialogue mechanisms as fundamental to, to, to managing these difficult processes to ensure an equitable and non-discriminatory um, approaches. We really do not want or wish to see this crisis lead to a rollback of rights at work. So throughout the region, the ILO has been working hard to promote and support social dialogue to ensure a socially just and sustainable recovery. The one last thing, um, Connie, is we have been gathering information to learn lessons on what might be most effective for sustaining jobs and incomes. Learning lessons is important, particularly because there are no simple answers, you know, to this unprecedented and complex uh, crisis. And given the scope of the negative impact, we have strengthened the partnership and collaboration with other development partners, particularly with other UN agencies, to ensure that concerted and coordinated support to give um, to, to, to be given countries. We have a very important role play. Uh, the ILO has a very important role to play in implementing the UN's framework uh, for assisting the recovery. I can go on and on. Um, as you know, we have been working so hard since the beginning of the pandemic, but let me stop here. Back to you, Connie. Quite obviously, your heart is full and uh, your sleeves are rolled up uh, to be in action and to uh, really put everything on the ground that you've just spelled out. Uh, thank you to Moko for this at this point. Uh, we'll be talking later, but first of all, let's actually have a look together at uh, some of the highlights of the discussions you had last Thursday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone and uh, Swadika from all of us here in Bangkok. No doubt, we all remember the year 2020 like no other. The latest ILO monitor indicates in the second quarter of this year, working hours in Asia Pacific declined by 13.5% compared to the last quarter of 2019. This is equal to 235 million full-time jobs. We all know these are not just numbers. They are there are multitudes of devastating human stories behind these numbers. Let us not forget that in crisis, women are often disproportionately affected. This crisis is no exception. Women workers are overrepresented in many of the most at-risk industries. Furthermore, violence and harassment against women has escalated at home, workplace, and in society. Responding to the crisis, many countries in the region have shown tremendous leadership, solidarity, and innovation. Stimulus packages and social protection measures rolled out quite quickly. 
Unfortunately, there is growing consensus that a crisis will be with us longer than initially hoped. Great action and collective resolve are needed to foster a recovery that is inclusive of all. The good news is that we already have roadmaps for addressing many of these challenges. For our region, the Bali Declaration adopted at the 16th Asia-Pacific Regional Meeting and also the ILO Centenary Declaration on the Future of Work adopted last year lay out the principles to guide our collective action. What will a post-COVID-19 future of work look like? Difficult to predict what tomorrow will look like in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. But one thing is certain, some changes are coming to the world at work. Of course, technology, technology will pay, play the major role. One, remote working, virtual mid training will become the new normal and many, in many sectors. We may need to rethink our global supply chain and concentrate on enhancing regional, local supply chain to survive during the critical period. We may need to diversify our industries. This will help us to absorb external shocks. For these things to happen, we need different set of skills and investment. We have actually felt the value of social dialogue and witness its contribution to keep the economy running to a certain level, even during critical and crucial time. During the pandemic, loss of employment is inevitable. Reports of retrenched workers are on the rise. In searching for new job opportunities during this trying period, we can expect the shifting of focus towards providing necessary skills to workers so that they can remain relevant in the world of work. While this is true that labor market is facing global disruption at an unprecedented scale, this is where attention and investment are needed in areas that are sustainable, such as green job creation. We must continue to increase investment in people's capabilities, in the institutions of work, and in decent and sustainable work. At the ASEAN level, as the current chairman of ASEAN Labour Ministers Meeting, we have convened an online meeting on 14 May 2020 and came up with a joint statement on response on, to the impact of COVID-19 on labour and employment. Joint statement focuses on providing support to workers, including access to proper health care and other necessary assistance in terms of active labour market policies social protection, and occupational safety and health. It is both proud and humbling to see that ASEAN member states are able to showcase our solidarity amid, and amid the pandemic. As we adapt to a new norm, global efforts are essential as countries need to work together towards a better future of work by learning and cooperating with one another and by continuing to communicate with one another. When we are witnessing an unprecedented crisis in the labor market, government should develop and implement a paradigm shifting measures to protect not only standard, but also non-standard workers, not only um, paid workers, but unpaid workers, and to develop a more inclusive social protection package that can cover new forms of work. Especially during this crisis, it has been proven that not only paid jobs, but also unpaid jobs, especially unpaid care jobs, is very valuable to our society. And also, I would like to highlight inclusive and universal social protection should also include universal health care. When we talk about the future work, it is hard to separate it from the future of business, economic and the social impact of the pandemic is forcing us to rethink business models, workplace practice, policy architecture, and even the way we think about the future. 
sustainability and resilience will be a, at the core of business strategy. The crisis has shown how much we depend on business. The private sector is central to the employment and the consumption and, and their recovery. We have seen how critical dialogue and cooperation in this crisis response. Last year, the ILO adopted Sentinel Declaration. We could not anticipate the current crisis, but the declaration has set out some important pathway forward, which are very relevant in this context. This includes the critical role of private sector and the importance of productive and sustainable enterprise. Our immediate priority is recovery from enterprise job. Business continuity, faster recovery, liquidity, and the leaf measure must reach the real economy. What should a uh, post-COVID world of work look like? It's very simple. We just need to make sure the paradigm shift uh, keeps going in the direction of our income led or uh, inclusive growth and the descent back for all, which we have been following for last 12 years since the aftermath of the previous global recession. To this end, as mentioned by uh, Tomoko, Regional Director of the ILO, labor market institutions should be strengthened to reverse declining labor income share and rising income equality, with fundamental workers' rights being respected. Also, fiscal policy for adequate social spending for universal social protection based on improvement of domestic mobilization, including fair taxation, should be implemented. So in conclusion, it is uh, essential to shift the paradigm, uh, policy paradigm from the current market and debt-driven growth to uh, income-led growth, which is a growth model based on uh, high income and the poor labor distributional policies that generate by boosting domestic demand and equitable, inclusive, and resilient growth model for the future of work. We need to revitalize democracy with a new social contract through improved social dialogue, revitalize collective representation and social dialogue, and stresses that the collective representation of workers through social dialogue is a public good that lies at the heart of democracy. These conditions constitute a serious hindrance to trade unions in organizing workers. But the only way to break down this hindrance is to meet our fundamental requirement of being more representative by organizing, organizing, and organizing. What has worked or what appears not to be working in meeting the objectives of supporting enterprises and protecting our workers. The social protection system is one of the, the critical factors for driving a country's social and economic resilience. Based on our experience so far, we are the few that the social safety net is urgently necessary to support a stable economy as well as supporting business or industry and protecting jobs. The new normal life has also opened up new employment opportunity, which can be utilized through adaptive change and appro appropriate incentives. The government of Indonesia has translated the ILO guideline by issuing policy that supports business sustainability by maintaining preparedness in dealing with the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. On the question of sustainability, the government is now addressing national emergencies, preparedness, both economically and socially, including the following economic diversification, social protection to ensure the most vulnerable are not left behind and ensure families 
and individual households are suitably prepared for national emergencies as highlighted by this pandemic. Next to long-term measures will center around implementing employment detention measures and redeployment through training already allocated funds to government stimulus packages and specific to the tourism sector. In some more, and the same can largely be said for other Pacific island countries. They are informal sectors that serve a vital purpose, especially in the village economies. Informal economies are typically characterized by a high incidence of poverty and severe decent work deficits. Therefore, formalization must serve the purpose of addressing decent work deficits and poverty while also recognizing the cultural and social dynamics that exist and work for maintaining peace and social harmony within communities. Employers are very clear on what this would constitute. We need policy responses that are based on a jobs recovery. Private sector led growth is the path to sustainable and inclusive recovery. There is no other. Private sector jobs have been lost and private sector jobs will be recovered. We must focus on business continuity and recovery. The enabling policy environment for doing business, for us to trade and develop resiliently is more important than ever. Sustainable enterprise is not an employer slogan. It is the pressing necessity for recovery. We need to promote productive employment and the incomes, living standards and job securities that flow from productivity. We say productivity will be critical to recovery and shaping the world of work going forward. We need to tackle the transition from informality to formality more than ever before. We must invest in skills and lifelong learning with the active involvement of employers organisation in the governance of skills systems to ensure that we're getting the right supply of skills that our labour market needs. We also have a clear demonstration in this crisis of the need to build sustainable systems of social protection. We are in a defining moment for the ILO and its relevance to the real world of work in our region and globally. The ILO is not remote from us, it is us. Employers, workers and governments and all of us as social partners have a moral responsibility to help our communities recover from the impact of this pandemic. Employers particularly welcome the ILO focusing on productivity and we need to see this translated into actions and services to constituents in the Asian region and globally. This emphasis on productivity reflects exactly the real economy focus that employers will look at in determining which jobs come back after the crisis, how they're organised and what we reinvest in. And the crisis has highlighted the importance of skills and skills portability, both within and between countries. Agility of skills can be instrumental in addressing worker displacement as companies automate. There has been uh, the capacity, particularly in workplaces, for uh, workers and employers to address many of the challenges together about how to try and ensure that jobs continued and how workers were safe. But we also saw in this country thousands of workers overnight thrown out of work into unemployment. The union movement campaigned for a wage subsidy to be introduced by the government so that these workers were able to stay connected to their work uh, without uh, a huge rise in unemployment. And I'm pleased to say that the, with the support of some employer organisations, we actually managed to achieve a government wage subsidy, which has been in place now for a number of months. I'll end by saying it is not a perfect system. Some workers have been left out of that um, uh, initiative. Uh, visa workers, short-term casual workers, many workers in arts and entertainment and higher education were excluded by the government from coverage of this scheme. But three and a half million workers are covered by it and this is keeping them connected to work today. We're concerned that that scheme is due to come to an end in September. So right now we are working on what are the plans that are needed to keep people in work, to support those people that are outside of paid employment and to make sure that we end up with a more just and fair system. We don't wanna rebuild the same way. 
We want to rebuild in a fairer way where every worker is considered, where nobody is left behind. Thank you. We now come to the concluding session, uh, Road to Recovery. And at this conclusion session, we will bring together three speakers to make forward-looking suggestions for policies, collective action, and possible solutions. The two top priorities for employers at the country level are productivity and skill development. And the one priority for collaboration at the regional level is tackling informality. Productivity has been highlighted in both the Bali Declaration and the ILO Centenary Declaration. For this, it is vital that tripartite constituents, one, promote entrepreneurship and innovation to create new jobs, two, strengthen effective social dialogue, the capacity of representative worker and employer organizations, and involve social partners in the development of social and employment policies. In the skill development space, we need to anticipate and create the skills needed in the new normal. Strengthening labor market institutions for skill development policies and programs, including the capacity of social partners to engage with the government in this context. At the regional level, employers consider tackling informality as the top priority for collaboration as more than 68% of the employed population in Asia Pacific are in the informal economy. Universal social protection, social and economic impact on workers and their families due to job losses and income must be mitigated. This must include wage subsidies, unemployment benefits, universal health care, paid sick leave, and must be inclusive of casual and informal workers. A global fund for universal social protection should urgently be put in place to enable the poorest nations to be able to respond to the pandemic and future shocks. This crisis has exposed the weakness of the current labor protection systems in many countries in our region. It has also exposed the enormous risk to labor rights and unregulated global supply chains where millions of workers have lost their jobs in the region. The Asia Pacific region already suffering from a huge deficit in fundamental rights, workers' rights, is now even worse off with the current crisis without employment or income protection. Respect for workers' rights should be placed at the core of the strategy for an inclusive and sustainable recovery, recognizing and, and enabling the freedom of association and collective bargaining. States must refrain from using the current crisis to weaken labor rights to ensure an equitable and inclusive recovery and achieve decent work. Effective res respect for freedom of association and collective bargaining should be promoted at all levels as a key means to meet the health, social and economic challenges posed by the pandemic. The response of the government of India to the pandemic has been to provide relief to the most vulnerable groups and sectors like women, migrant workers, MSME, and rural India. In the present scenario, we need to rewrite the rules of the work, of world of work in the context of new normal created by the pandemic. For example, work from home and flexible working hours has become the new norm. More employment opportunities are now available on the digital platform. We also need to take special measures for some sectors like hospitality, aviation sector, tourism sector, which have been adversely affected in the crisis. We are we as a part of the Asia Pacific region, along with ILO must work together to form not only short term solutions, but also long term solutions to the challenges like poverty, unemployment, public debt and economic slowdowns resulting from COVID-19. India is taking every possible measures to turn the 
adverse situation into opportunities and to build a future for our workers. As countries move towards reopening our economies, we fully agree with the ILO's emphasis on placing humans at the centre of the recovery effort. This is why, in addition to saving jobs, we are helping our workers who lose their jobs find new pathways to bounce back in life. Through our SG United Jobs and Skills Package, we aim to generate close to 100,000 opportunities in jobs, trainingships, attachments and skills training. Instead of allowing the downturn to erode our human capital, we want to enhance it so that we can, as a nation, emerge stronger. Going forward, we can expect disruptive and difficult changes to how we work and do business. The ILO Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work continues to provide valuable guidance and will be the focus of discussions at the 17th ILO Asia and Pacific Regional Meeting to be held in April 2021. Singapore is honoured and privileged to be hosting this meeting. We hope that by then, we will be able to welcome meeting attendees to Singapore in person. More than ever, our region must work together to coordinate an effective international response. The ILO stands ready to assist you. That was quite an affirmation uh, at the end, uh, Tomoko. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. And those were the 20 minute highlights uh, of the regional event in Asia and the Pacific. Now, I heard a number of things, um, and probably that mirrors the diversity of the region um, that uh, you represent and work with, uh, Tomoko. Uh, I even heard things like uh, we have to rethink the global supply chain. We have to diversify and maybe look more at the region. Now, of course, that's a question of production processes. But what I've heard time and again was that, um, quote, we need sustainable systems of social protection. Uh, we need uh, increase of productivity. We need skill development. Um, but it all seemed to sort of center around uh, the protective aspect, almost as in the SDGs. What were your main takeaways, Tomoko? Yes, Connie, um, yeah, there are so many important and excellent points made during the discussion. Uh, to me, um, there are three key messages. First, I felt the energy, optimism and ambition to recover better and stronger, as you heard. Everyone recognized that road to recovery is a long one, full of daunting tasks. And yet there was a positive energy and a high level ambition that we must rise to the occasion and work hard so that we can turn this crisis into an astounding opportunity to build a better, stronger, more sustainable and more inclusive society. I was particularly glad that uh, environmental sustainability was not forgotten as we have been pro uh, promoting green jobs and just transition for the past several years amid the global debate on climate change. And I found this high level ambition very encouraging. As you say, you know, it uh, encompasses the three uh, pillars of the SDGs, economic, social and environment. That was the first message. The two, uh, the second, a call for placing humans at the core of the recovery strategy. The need to address inadequate social protection. Indeed, it, there's a lot to do. A rampant informality, growing gender and income inequality and weak labor rights were all highlighted uh, along with the call for policy measures on comprehensive social protection, sustainable enterprises, and the labor rights, again, you know, SDGs. The call for a human-centered approach, you, you call it, uh, also included, as you rightfully pointed out, urgent needs to address various issues related to skills development, reskilling, upskilling in support of the retrenched workers and new job seekers in the new normal. The third message I, I took is the need to work together. The importance of the tripartite constraints working together through social dialogue was repeatedly mentioned, as you heard. 
They want a meaningful social dialogue, which will allow a, allow for better understanding of the real issues affecting uh, vulnerable people and small enterprises. They want effective social dialogue, which facilitates consultation on the best way forward in a manner that would be beneficial to all, that would be beneficial to all. And also emphasized was the importance of the regional cooperation. You have heard the uh, chair of the ASEAN Labor Ministers uh, meeting that uh, they were able to issue. I'm not quite sure whether you see what I'm seeing, but uh, it seems that the line has uh, just frozen uh, Tomoko in her last uh, words. So I just hope uh, that she hears our thank you very much. Um, I assume you were sort of on your last couple of words. Uh, so uh, a thank you in absentia. Oh, no, there you are. At least you can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I was uh, uh, on the last point. Um, it was emphasizing the regional cooperation and the, you know, the um, ASEAN's uh, exemplary way of uh, issuing a joint statement showcasing their solidarity amid the pandemic. And you heard Singapore uh, inviting them all for APLM in April next year. In, uh, next year. Um, so we now, with this uh, regional uh, meeting yet, uh, last uh, week, we now start the journey to the next APRM. And we will continue our conversation with all pertinent issues, uh, with all parties and on all pertinent issues and incorporate them all in the background document to the next APRM. So the, the, the busy, busy time to come. Thank you very much. Um, this road has not been traveled to its end. Uh, we're probably sort of at the beginning of this new marathon. Thank you very much for sharing the view from Bangkok. Uh, and I'll actually turn over to Amman, uh, where uh, the acting ILO director, uh, regional director for the Arab states, Frank Hagemann, is already sort of uh, waiting to share his views. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know our pattern is that we first want to hear from the people in the region and we have prepared a little video to share their views, the view from the ground. أكيد المخاوف كتير 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 كبيرة مش بس لمعلمات كل اللي عم يشتغلوا واللي حاسين There is a lot of fear and concern كتير بزنسز عم بيسكروا فكمان قد في تشانس اللي ما عنده وظيفه يكون عنده انه انه فرصه ليرجع يقدم على وظيفه ثانيه وهو انا اكيد حيقبل انه ياخذ نص The teaching staff are very much concerned they are concerned about losing their jobs انه بكيف الشباب حيرجعوا يفكروا انه يهاجروا ويسافروا ويتركوا بلدهم ويتركوا عائلتهم ليقدروا بمحلات to support their families بسبب جائحه كورونا تغير نمط عملنا كامل because of the corona crisis, our lives have been turned upside down. We've got less work. This applies to farmers. We also are affected by the crisis. We've got to respect social distancing. We have to wear masks and gloves. We need to keep distance. And we don't have any other income apart from farming apart from agriculture. This means that we are suffering very significant economic consequences. I feel guilty. My children are at school and I had to, or they're not at school and I had to go back to work. However, our pay has been cut in half. I've learned to be patient as a result and I am following very closely what's happening. I'm following social media. I've worked very hard for 13 years now, and I'm hopeful that things will return to normal sooner or later. Before the coronavirus, we worked uh, normally, but since the crisis, there's been a huge change. Of course, I felt the impact in my work. People are scared. They're scared of getting the virus. They don't want to get takeout food. And even the scientists, the experts don't have a solution to offer us. So of course, I had to shut down my shop. I was scared, scared for myself, scared for my family. But we are returning to normal little by little. Yeah, little by little, uh, it's 
uh, how the return will probably go. I'm pleased now to welcome Frank Hagemann, Acting ILO Regional Director for Arab States, um, now from Amman. The uh, broadcast last week was from Beirut, uh, but that shows you the... Uh, so here we are, we've got... We have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just seen a teacher, a farm worker, cookie shop owner, baker. All of them had that word fear somewhere uh, in their statements. Uh, Frank, what do you hear uh, from your region? What is the greatest concern? Could you unmute yourself, Frank? Thank you. Thank you, Connie, and um, uh, good afternoon to you from Amman. Uh, thank you for having me on the uh, on the program. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here. Um, if we uh, take into account what we have just seen, I think it illustrates uh, very well uh, with a health crisis, but very much with an economy, with an economic and uh, and the labor market crisis of significant uh, proportions. Uh, Labor markets throughout the region have taken a big hit. Uh, workers have suffered, businesses have suffered, and employers uh, have suffered. And I wish I could say that there is an end in sight. Now, of course, of course, um, the uh, the region is, is very diverse, you know, and uh, it, the impact differs between countries. Uh, some countries have uh, been impacted more, others less. Some sectors have been. Uh, impacted in, in different ways, you know. But by and large, by and large, um, there are a number of commonalities uh, we see uh, across the region. One is um, a significant drop in demand, um, then a reduction in trade, and thirdly, uh, uh, and, and very much so, uh, a disruption of production. Now, what does that all mean for the labor market? Um, we've seen unemployment. Unemployment rise, unfortunately, uh, dramatically. Also, eight an equivalent of eight million jobs uh, has been has been lost uh, in the region in the last few months. Uh, underemployment has been increasing as well, and uh, and inequalities, uh, which uh, you know have been emphasized so much already by my colleague in Asia, have been rising uh, again uh, as well. Uh, now, who has suffered most? Uh, which group has been impacted most? Uh, Again, I think in line with the global experience, we see that certain groups which were already disadvantaged pre-crisis, uh, such as women workers in our region, have been, um, uh, have, uh, have been impacted even more so during the COVID. Women workers, in addition to women workers, we have, uh, we have refugees. Uh, there are millions of refugees in the region. We have migrant workers and internally displaced. Again, we are talking about millions, uh, especially in the Gulf countries where they often constitute the majority of the of the workforce. And of course, then uh, the, uh, the 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 very important number of uh, informal economy workers uh, who often wor work without any protection and uh, who have been very much exposed uh, to to job losses uh, uh, during the last uh, few months. Uh, over to you again, Connie. Quite a challenge, uh, it sounds. So uh, what is the take of the ILO? Um, how do you contribute um, to tackling the challenges? Well, I think at the outset, at the outset, we have to keep in mind uh, that uh, this is not the first crisis our region is going through. Uh, a, number, a number of countries in the, in the region have, had, have gone through many forward crises over the last uh, few years, if not decades. Crisis, conflicts, wars, you name it all, you know. So here we, in COVID, we have another disruptive layer, uh, which has been put on a, on a, on a, on a, on decades, on decades of, of disruption and, and, and crisis. Uh, crisis. Uh, now, of course, you know, if you look at labor markets, uh, uh, robust labor markets are in a position to weather a new onset of crisis better. But given that many countries in our region have underlying conditions, if you will, you know, they are particularly fragilized already, you know, and uh, and prone to even more disruption. Um, you know, what have uh, what have uh, governments uh, done in the last few months? What have they put in place as a response, and how have we supported them? 
um, very much as we have seen uh, across Asia and other parts of the world, basically two streams of action. One has been to uh, safeguard, uh, safeguard jobs um, and, and to, boost, uh, to boost the economies with economic uh, uh, stimulus packages uh, to business continuity and to uh, support to workers, be it to income support, uh, uh, wage uh, uh, subsidies and, and, and cash transfers. And then, of course, and we have helped actively governments in that and preparing plans and preparing programs and packages for that. And then, of course, for those who have been uh, uh, um, in, a, in, a, you know, in the fortunate situation of keeping their job uh, to make sure that they are safer uh, uh, at, their, at their workplace. And again, we have actively worked with uh, all our constituents here in the region uh, to make sure uh, that they uh, get our advice, our guidance and the tools we have uh, to, uh, to ensure that the uh, workplaces are, that the sanitary and hygienic conditions in, in workplaces are, are ensured. Now, there's one aspect I would like to mention in particular, uh, because I emphasize now in the last few minutes very much the the, the emergency and short-term measures, if you will. Some of the governments in the region, um, and I'm particularly uh, pleased about that, I must say, some of the governments in the region have been able to look beyond the short term and, uh, and, uh, and realized, look, there are important uh, um, uh, dysfunctionalities, if you will, in the labor market uh, and structural weaknesses. Uh, and why not take now the crisis as an opportunity and address some of these illnesses, you know, structural illnesses. Uh, for example, and I will just give two examples. One is that there has been a lack of policy making, labor market and employment policy making in the region. Some governments now realize, well, look, let's prepare for the future, even when we are in crisis, so that we are better prepared uh, in, in the years to come and for the next crisis, you know. And, uh, and secondly, um, there, uh, there is a lack of social protection in this region. For example, only one third of countries have uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, and the number of governments now turn to us and say, look, can you please help us build up robust systems of social protection, social security in particular, which are self-financing, which are financially sustainable, and which will help us buffer uh, the impact of any crisis to come. Thank wow. you and over to you again. Thank you very much, Frank, for sharing that. Um, actually, on that optimistic note, uh, we would like to have a look at what was uh, recorded last week. And again, a four hour discussion uh, shortened to around about 20 minutes. But before, ladies and gentlemen, we're actually going to hit the start button uh, for the um, Arab event. Please, uh, for those of you who have had trouble listening to some of our Vox Pop or for the uh, longer piece, is. Um, you have just been listening normally to what you see on the stream uh, on the internet. You actually have the choice uh, of changing the language section um, and the language reception. So if you want to listen just in English, uh, then do that. I think those of you who want to listen in French will have already done that. Uh, so there are several selections. But now, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a look at what was happening last Wednesday morning when everybody uh, got together in Beirut virtually and put their heads together. Today's regional event is critical as it allows us to focus on the challenges that are specific to our region. We aim today to discuss and provide policy insights for an improved, comprehensive and effective response to the COVID-19 crisis in the Arab states. In line with the ILO Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work that was adopted by the International Labour Conference in June 2019. According to the latest ILO now casting model estimates, lockdown measures resulted in 13% loss in hours of work in the second quarter of 2020 compared to the last pre crisis quarter, which is equivalent to 8 million full time jobs, 18 million individuals or one third of total employment are working in at risk sectors facing high risks of layoffs, reduction of wages or hours of work. The Arab Labour Organization with the ILO work together to prepare programs and activities that would serve the interests of the Arab countries in dealing with the consequences of COVID-19 where labor markets in the Arab world led to a situation of 
contraction, economic collapse, leading to dire consequences for workers, um, employers, and put the government in a challenge unseen, in front of a challenge unseen before. Because of the COVID-19 crisis has caused extensive damage to the economy and the world of labor, this session will discuss the policies that would support enterprises, protect workers, and to ensure the maintenance of industrial relations. Question, what are the measures being taken and which sectors in particular are in need of greater stability? Ladies and gentlemen, in Saudi Arabia, we were on the forefront uh, of dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, preemptive and precautionary measures were taken at an early stage and we provided all possible measures to deal with the crisis as we did. Economic sectors were hardest hit by the situation. Only sectors uh, auxiliary to health services, uh, production of disinfectants and uh, masks uh, were operational, the rest uh, ground to a halt. And we have come to realize that the informal economy was the biggest loser in the process. The lack of appropriate measures to look after the informal economy has laid bare the shortcomings in the Kingdom of Bahrain, and I will focus on the world of work here, we furloughed all salaries of workers in the private sector without exception for three months. During that period, we also provided support to all employers. And in addition to furloughing wages, we provide them with a package, packages of support uh, in order to allow them not to make workers red redundant. And we looked at the financial situation of each enterprise. In light of this crisis where local workers or migrants found themselves on the same boat, uh, we believe uh, that the response to dealing with foreign labor force was satisfactory. However, this crisis has laid bare the weaknesses in the observation of workers' rights and providing them with the requirements to defend their rights. And migrant workers, now more than any time before, need to enjoy these rights and to find methods of dealing with the, with the period to come. Our government has made sure that contractual arrangements with employers continue to be governed by labor laws and pay is guaranteed. Um, support for with paying uh, utility bills and we will continue with this policy in the hope that decent work would be guaranteed to our works for next June. The spread of coronavirus in the Lebanon coincided with an already existing difficult economic situation. As a result, the government had taken measures to contain the virus. There was lockdown and an attempt to deal with the financial and economic consequences of the crisis. In spite of these complexities, the government looked at this situation as an opportunity to look at the future and in order to fulfill decent work, the requirements and respect to human rights. If we were to look at this crisis in the long term, we can see some positives that may be coming out of it. There is greater emphasis on technology, especially in light of social distancing. As a result, greater, greater 
uh, attention was given to education and technology and uh, e-commerce and I believe this will be the future post COVID-19. The pandemic was a wake-up call to the Arab countries and how to deal with situations like this and how to protect workers and their families and the implementation of uh, social protection programs at a higher level has proved to be the recipe for dealing with the crises of this nature. How did member states react to supporting families and uh, households? How did the, these governments look at uh, social protection programs, uh, paying contributions, and what led the, to a change in the situation? It has become clear to everyone now with this crisis that contributions to social security programs and the reorganization, restructuring of the labor work is an important element in dealing with this problem. As a result, at SME level, we have taken some uh, uh, measures that would stimulate uh, contributions, help these uh, companies to pay their contribution through with the help of the central bank. And we also instructed uh, social security uh, uh, system to help uh, support the contribution of some workers. In 2010-2011 at the ILC, we discussed social protection floors and this topic was at the forefront as of issues discussed as a result of the 2008 financial crisis. We realized that countries with sound social protection floors were able to recover much quicker and in a better way than other countries. However, this lesson was not learned by many countries and now we are hit by another uh, type of crisis and cannot cope with it. Uh, we have worked together with all social partners in Syria and used international direct uh, financing to deal with the consequences of this crisis. We were able also to ensure that workers laid off get their salaries and we were able to provide incentives to the production sectors taking into account the need to maintain the production process. This is part of the precautionary measures. As you all know, a number of Arab countries, including Palestine, lacked a proper social protection system because we do not have an institutional environment that would ensure that social protection comes out of a situation where they have to rely on assistance into investment. And this is one of the issues that we are trying to achieve and come out of this vicious circle of just providing uh, assistance in case of emergency. Ladies and gentlemen, the UAE has put uh, the health and safety of all citizens and um, expats living on Australia at the top priority. And we were able to respond to this pandemic through solidarity amongst the various governments, the sector, the public sector and the private. Uh, and we believe the policies that we have adopted can set a good example for others to follow. I think workers worldwide in general and workers in the Arab world in particular need not only training and education, but need to legislation and laws that can be implemented if we were to deal with the changes that we're seeing in the world of work. I think this crisis is a golden opportunity for all of us to ensure that fairness and equality of enjoyment of treatment is there for all. In fact, measures taken by governments in the region, including Iraq, uh, 
aims to provide uh, safety and good health for workers uh, and uh, ensure that the spread of the pandemic is kept to the minimum. Of course, these do not come, these measures do not come out without, without consequences and we believe that uh, this would have an impact on those who are trying to earn a living. Of course, the plummeting oil prices did not help with trying to provide uh, support or to provide protection to certain families. In our social protection programs, we have to focus on protecting the self-employed and we also need to encourage them to contribute to social protection programs. A lot of self-employed do not wish to contribute to social protection programs. In situations like this, we are find ourselves compelled to provide incentives. We are compelled to help them in this process. Uh, as a result of the unprecedented situation caused by COVID-19, this last session in today's meeting will focus on how employers organizations can cooperate with their governments to deal with the impact of COVID-19 on the economy as a whole. Social dialogue assumes a central role in um, determining the relationship between the um, constituents of, of the ILO. Therefore, it is important to this uh, social dialogue would be part of uh, dealing with uh, how to find solutions to the current crisis. What is, in your opinion, the best way to develop uh, uh, this dialogue, uh, exchange of information between uh, workers, employers, uh, representatives and governments, especially when it comes to social economic policies? And what is, in your opinion, the best way to take measures to ensure that social dialogue is effective and leads uh, to the right outcome. Social justice, uh, the, the current situation, must be a pillar and, uh, uh, that would provide guidance to member states on how to implement international labour standards and also to take balanced and accurate measures using tripartism to come out with the right approach in dealing with the uh, post-COVID-19. We are confident that through this cooperation we will be able to reach that result. I believe we could have mitigated the impact of the pandemic if there was a true tripartite dialogue led by governments and if there were true political will on the part of governments then we would have been able to help both workers and enterprises that was hardest hit by the crisis and here i have to bring everybody's attention to the fact that although some arab countries have started with a true social dialogue and this has led to agreement <laughs> تجربتنا الفلسطينيه هي تجربه نعتقد انها ساهمت وخففت بشكل كبير جدا من اثار الناتج عن جائحه الكورونا وكان تجربه رائعه في التعاون بين والشراكه بين اطراف الانتاج الثلاثه وخاصه في تحمل المسؤوليه الكامله من اجل حمايه المجتمع الفلسطيني واصبحت عندنا يعني قضايا مهمه وواضحه في كما ذكرت في العمل عن بعد وفي قضيه تامين وعمل ضمان اجتماعي في في فلسطين وفي الارض الفلسطينيه الارض الفلسطينيه. احنا اساسا قبل جائحه كورونا عندنا توقف كثير من المشاريع الصناعيه، يعني بنسبه 95 90% متوقف من المشاريع الصناعيه، لذلك عندنا عندنا بطاله ايضا، اما بعد جائحه فزادت هذه المشكله وما زاد الطين بلل. حقيقه نحتاج الى اراده سياسيه حقيقه شاء تاخذ بيد القطاع الخاص الصناعي لكي يتمكن من خلق هذه الفرص وتوفير منتجات للبلد في نفس الوقت. في هذا الظرف الصعب تعرفون انتم اليوم البلد تحول من عولمه الى 
انغلاق على 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 الدول على نفسها لحتى توفر منتجاتها وان شاء الله نامل انه نتعدى هذه المرحله وياخذ العراق بالتعافي بما في القطاع الصناعي الخاص والف شكر شكرا جزيلا للجميع. اصبحت عزيزه الفوائد مع التشارك في وسيله اساسيه لمواجهه بعض هذه التحديات. وضروره ملحه وليس ترفا وانما اساسا مواجهه واستغلال الفرص الناشئه عن التغيرات في عالم العمل والتطورات التكنولوجيه. الحوار الاجتماعي عنصر اساسي في تعزيز التقدم الاجتماعي والاقتصادي وضمان ضمان العمل اللائق للجميع وبناء مؤسسات اكثر انتاجيه وفعاليه وتحقيق امور افضل وظروف عمل افضل فضلا عن ارساء السلام والعداله الاجتماعيه وفي ظل الظروف والازمات التي يعاني منها العالم ونتيجه لتداعيات كوفيد 19 اصبح اصبح محور اساسي للمحافظة على اقتصاديات الدول وضروره بلحة بين الشركاء الاجتماعيين. المنطقه العربيه جائحه كورونا باوضاع مختلفه من بلد الى اخر ولكنها اجمالا كشفت هشاشه وضعف في كثير من البلدان العربيه وضعفت الصعوبات الموجوده اساسا في عده دول عربيه. اتضح ذلك جليا في الدول التي تشهد حروبا منذ فترات طويله. والتي تعاني من الفقر وضعف الخدمات الصحية والتعليمية كما الخدمات في المياه والكهرباء وأيضا الغلاء وانهيار العملة الوطنية وتوقف الرواتب وفقدان الوظائف وخلفت الكثير من الضحايا والجرحى والإعاقات والنزوح وحالات اجتماعية كثيرة بحاجة إلى معالجات أغلب الدراسات التي حتى كانت سابقة للأزمة التي نعيشها في الأيام الحالية تحدثت عن التطور التكنولوجي وأثره على أسواق العمل تغني عن العديد وأرقام عديدة من من الوظائف التي الموجودة في سوق العمل حاليا. إن مبدأ الصحة والسلامة المهنية للعمال هو مكسب للطرفين لأصحاب العمل وللعامل نفسه بحيث يقي صاحب العمل من الآثار المترتبة على أي ضرر أو خطر يهدد صحة وسلامة العمال طبعاً إحنا تم الاستطلاع مدى الضرر الذي وقع على القطاع الخاص في الفترة انتشار الفيروس وقياس تداعياته على عالم المال والأعمال وعلى أثاره فقد قامت الغرفة بتقديم رئياتها للحكومة البحرينية كونها أحد أطراف صنع القرار في المملكة لوضع خطة داعمة مستقبلية للقطاعات الاقتصادية المتضررة كما نتطلع اليوم إلى أن نخرج من هذا الاجتماع بتوصيات تساعد على مواجهة التحديات التي نتعرض لها اليوم في هذه الفترة الاستثنائية أهم إشي في هذا الموضوع أن لا يكون عمالنا متسولين يجب أن يكون في هناك قوانين ناظمة عادلة تتماشى مع معايير العمل الدولية والتي أكدت عنها أيضا معايير العمل العربية وثقافة الحوار الاجتماعي البناء هي الذي يجب أن تسود بالحفاظ على الحريات والحفاظ على حق التنظيم النقابي واحترام ممثلي كل الأطراف إن كان العمال أو الحكومات أو أصحاب العمل واسمحوا لي أن أؤكد هنا على أن ما نصب إليه من تع... وما تعلمناه من دروس في هذه الأزمة يتطلب منا أن نحرص جميعا على وضع سياسات واستراتيجيات وبرامج لا تكون آنية محصورة بمواجهة الأزمة وإنما تكون راسخة بمنظور تنموي دائم وشامل يلامس الواقع ويحاكي الطاقة ويحاكي التطور المستقبلي ويأخذ بعين الاعتبار ما طرأ من تطور تقني وتكنولوجي على طبيعة فرص العمل المعروضة والتي باتت في كثير من الأحيان لا تتناسب مع مهارات اليد العاملة المعروضة ناهيك عن انقراض الكثير من فرص العمل التقليدية يعني التجربة ليست سهلة اللي مرينا فيها جميعا واعتقد أن هي سوف تفرض على منظمة العمل الدولية وعلى الدول الأعضاء رؤية جديدة في العمل ليست تقليدية لا أظن بأننا سوف نستمر بدات الخطط وذات التصورات اللي اعتمدناها في السابق نقاش مهم جدا اللي تم ولكني لا أظن أننا وصلنا إلى نهاية المطاف نحتاج أن نتعمق أكثر في عناوين محددة وندخل فيها بصورة أكثر دقة وأكثر تفصيل علها تساعدنا على يعني توفير المزيد من الحماية والمزيد من الرعاية والحماية الاجتماعية في دول 
довольны. I was uh, at fault myself, so having uh, unmuted myself, I would just like to pass on the message from me that sounded like a very rich discussion, Frank. Um, and I heard a number of things, again, 20 minutes uh, and a couple of key words, migrant workers, cooperation, social dialogue, social justice, um, the tripartite system uh, that was working. And uh, maybe the one thing that remained in my ear was we cannot go into the future as we've done before. Frank, what was your takeaway? What were the key words, the key messages that you will now take into the future? Thanks very much, uh, Connie. And uh, and indeed, it was a very rich uh, discussion. And, uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all participants, uh, all our constituents who so actively participated in the event uh, last Wednesday. Um, it was a real pleasure, I must say, listening to the um, and we gained uh, uh, important insights also for our own work and, and how to advance you know, our support to constituents in the region. Um, there was um, a strong call. I mean, there were a number of things coming out, obviously, of this event on Wednesday. But um, first and foremost, I think there was a strong call for working together, working together across countries in the region, working together with the international community, and working together between and among the stakeholders, the social partners, um, and the government uh, in the countries in the countries concerned. And that's a very important message. I think everybody realized this problem is too big to attack it alone. You know, we need to we need to stand together. Now, a couple of other messages uh, which which came out. I think it was very clearly uh, uh, said that this is not the time now for choices between the pro business and pro worker policies. Instead, bridges need to be built, you know, and linkages need to be established. We need to we need to support businesses. At the same time, we need to ensure the protection of workers. Uh, these things need to go in parallel. Then, of course, social protection was very much highlighted. And I think in two tracks, you know, on the one hand, you know, in the, the short term track to provide income support uh, to workers, especially the vulnerable workers, which has been um, now so much uh, uh, you know, suffering uh, during the crisis, and then to build up uh, the systems I was uh, referring to earlier, in particular, uh, uh, unemployment insurance and, and pension funds uh, for, for private uh, sector workers and, and to, you know, strengthen social security as such. Um, there was a strong call, I think, also for, for the need to be inclusive. You know, as I mentioned earlier, a number of uh, countries uh, have migrant workers. Uh, as a, as a, as a, or a majority of, of the labor force are migrant, uh, are constituted by migrant workers. And, uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, it has become very clear that everybody, all workers stand on the same ground, they all breathe the same air, you know, and there has to be equal treatment for all of them, uh, because the virus does not distinguish between a national and a non-national uh, worker. And, um, and, and so, uh, and for that reason, uh, you know, uh, non-national workers and migrant workers uh, have to be protected the same way as national workers uh, are, uh, are protected. Um, uh, social dialogue, of course, um, you mentioned it already, Connie, um, uh, many speakers refer to the importance uh, of, uh, of consultation, of developing solutions together uh, within a broad-based forum. Uh, um, and, and not just within countries, but, but regionally as well. And we are, of course, happy to, uh, to assist with that, you know, and to support uh, these uh, endeavors. Uh, uh, finally, finally, and I think that's a very important uh, message uh, coming from the meeting, uh, there was a strong emphasis on the uh, importance of international labor standards uh, and uh, the importance of the centenary uh, uh, declaration. Uh, both, you know, as a backbone for, for planning, as, as giving guidance for future policy making, and overall uh, for, for planning a, a better future uh, of work. Um, thank you very much, and over to you again.
now if two people are trying to unmute me uh, at the same time then it's sort of a double negative so uh, thank you very much frank hagerman acting ilo regional director for the arab states and ladies and gentlemen let me just give you a quick heads up um we are just going to uh run down our systems and uh, give in a breather of one minute and then we're coming on again so uh for everybody who is watching right now yes we're continuing we're continuing in a round about three minutes um, but sometimes uh, even the IT systems need uh, to breathe uh, that is what we're going to do now we um, will be seeing you in a three minutes roundabout so stay
clusters uh, of uh, five different regions. We've already looked at Asia Pacific. Uh, we have already looked at the Arab states and now we are on our way to looking at Africa. And if you remember our pattern, then you will know that we're now looking at how people from the ground are experiencing the changes due to COVID-19. Now, this time uh, in the Africa contribution, we have a slightly different take. We will have three voices, but it will be more like a report, a news report. So just enjoy. COVID-19 has hit Africa hard, affecting the health and livelihoods of millions. The world of work is no exception. Millions of workers are struggling to survive, especially those in the informal economy. Businesses have been doing what they can to respond. Across the region, COVID-19 knows no borders and carries a particular worry for young people, who make up 60% of the population, threatening to turn them into a lockdown generation that carries the resulting scars throughout their working lives. The virus endangers the health and livelihoods of informal workers who already faced a precarious situation with little access to social protection. And the most vulnerable could see their modest gains reversed, their hopes dashed, including children who are still caught in child labor. <laughs> Over the past six months, many African governments, workers and employers have come together to fight the spread of the virus. As the pandemic enters its second semester, the actors of the world of work will need to scale up dialogue and cooperation so that Africa can seize the opportunity to build back better. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Cynthia Samuel Olonjuwon. Uh, Cynthia, um, the last bit, uh, of course, of this uh, Vox Pop and report uh, was by the uh, child that has now gone into child labor, something uh, that we discussed at the ILO at the World Day Against Child Labor only three weeks ago. And uh, quite obviously, it is a strong um, force uh, that is driving kids to go to work and not to school. Uh, but I'm quite sure that that is not the only issue that you're dealing with. So um, what are your concerns? What do you hear? Thank you very much, Connie. Indeed, the voices that you had reflect some of the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 in Africa. And as you rightly said, it has implications for children. And I'll come back to that. Just as a backdrop and in uh, a complementary manner to the information already provided by the DG, 265 million workers are employed in countries with workplace closures in Africa. The equivalent of about 45 million full-time jobs have been lost in the second quarter of 2020. Youth unemployment and underemployment remain very high. Informal work has increased. 
the rate of youth informality in Africa is 93.4%, one of the highest in the world. Relative poverty rates for informal workers has been projected to increase from 21% before COVID to 83%, fourfold, almost a fourfold increase. Social protection coverage is less than 18%. The job crisis has disproportionately affected women. Inequality, as in other regions, has continued to increase. Social dialogue has suffered and the rights of workers are at risk. Many businesses are experiencing production downturn due to COVID-19. In one of the surveys that we undertook in Africa, 70% of the firms that we um, engaged with projected that there'll be lower revenue in 2020 compared to 2019. A lot of businesses, to put it very starkly, are at risk of insolvency or actual closure. In relating to children, 72 million children are estimated to be working. And these are just some of the figures that give us an indication of the socioeconomic impacts of, child, uh, of um, COVID-19 in Africa. These deficits affect real people. The boy you saw, Idrissa, is the disturbing face of child labor. Nelson Mandela, 25 years ago, told us that children are the rock on which every society is built of the young man we saw Idrissa should not be the face of the children that will build a greater future of work for us in Africa. And there are a lot of things that the ILO is doing to support that. When we look at Mustafa, the young guy, a young man in the informal economy, his plight is even worsened by the longstanding crisis in the Sahel with fragilities that, we, that, that have been experienced in some parts of Africa. Mustafa's plight is a great concern, but those women who are in this domestic work are particularly vulnerable. Important to note that those in the informal economy have no access to social protection. Many of them do not even earn the minimum wage. They have no savings and they can easily be lured into irregular migration. So that gives you a quick snapshot of what the situation is in the continent. We've already heard about uh, the generation COVID-19 and of course uh, in a continent uh, where so many people are young and certainly below 30, uh, it must have uh, an incredible impact. So um, what do you do? What can you do? As you rightly said, Connie, this is a crisis that is coming on top of a crisis that was on another crisis. So this is not even the first tier or the second tier crisis. However, it's seen as an opportunity to be able to address those fundamental deficits that were not prioritized in the past because the COVID pandemic has helped to really show the importance of addressing this as fundamental and important national development priorities. If I take the issue of the informal economy, which is huge in the continent, in many of the countries in Africa, the, 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 the informal economy was not visible. There were no effective policies. There were no coordinated, coordinated policies to address the issues of the informal economy, particularly looking at the informal economy as a source of growth, as a source of wealth, as a source of decent but the pandemic, even though it has its challenges, is seen now as an opportunity, a great opportunity to enable us revisit the way business was done in the past and then to build back better, to create the kind of future of work that is required for inclusive growth, for the necessary social justice, and then to ensure that the SDGs that many countries, that all countries have committed to actually achieved. Now, what are the things that we're doing specifically? I'll just give you an overview of, of, of some of these issues. One key area that was a challenge in the region is in terms of data, just to know how the pandemic has affected or impacted the economy. So a lot of the work that we've done in many of our countries is to support the impact assessment of the pandemic, but doing this in a way that will also help to build labor market information systems so that there would be policy relevant data at every point in time. 
it's starting and, and we have good examples of countries that are moving uh, very well on this. Social protection, that has come out, it came out in the uh, Vox Pop. It has come out also in other regions and you will see it's come up time and time again. Social protection is one of those areas where we have seen that we need to provide support to be able to address not just the child labor issue, not just informality, but to also strengthen the resilience of countries and of individuals to be able to absorb shocks. And one of the uh, supports that I'm really, really excited about, Connie, is the support that we're providing to the government of Mozambique, which helps the country to be able to use social protection measures, specifically cash transfers, to address immediate needs, but beyond addressing the immediate needs, to be able to use this system to strengthen social protection systems in the country. We're working with the World Bank, uh, UNICEF and other partners in Mozambique on this very, very innovative uh, approach. Another um, area of intervention that I'm really thrilled about is, is what we have done in support of Tunisia with the development of a comprehensive social and solidarity economy uh, legislation, which was adopted a few days ago. This, uh, this uh, legislation, this, this framework provides a solid, in fact, some have called it a revolutionary building block for addressing the issues, not only of the informal economy, but all other things that make for exclusion. Because as I said earlier, inequality in many of the countries have increased. In addition to this, of course, we provide the support anchored on the framework that uh, from the ILO framework, particularly in terms of supporting governments with the appropriate stimulus packages. Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia, I think uh, we might want to have a quick look at what you actually uh, did uh, last week uh, in the four hour event. Uh, and we have already uh, got the 20 minute lineup, uh, the 20 minutes lined up. So maybe we listen in and then we get back to your conclusions and to the steps uh, ahead. Thank you very much for sharing the two examples. Uh, but now let's have a look at what was hosted in Abidjan last week. Thank you very much. Sorry, I overran. You know, once you are into it, I get very passionate about it. Quite obviously. Building back better means that we must fully use the opportunity provided by the pandemic to ensure that no one is left behind. It's a call to make social protection for all a key national development goal. It means envisioning the informal economy as a critical asset supported to create decent jobs and become engines of economic growth and sustainable development. Notre défi du pays africain est donc est donc d'amener la plus grande proportion de l'économie informelle à migrer vers un emploi et une entreprise décent à travers un processus de formalisation qui allie qualité et quantité de l'emploi. La relance de l'économie appelle à des mesures fortes, ciblées, consistant à aider les entreprises à redémarrer leur activité encourager l'investissement dans les secteurs d'avenir comme les énergies renouvelables, l'agriculture, le tourisme, les industries de transformation, l'investissement dans, le dans le capital humain, le secteur de la santé et de l'éducation. The virus has so far taken more than 9,664 African lives and the prospects are that more lives will be lost. We, thus, we, we therefore call for international action to help strengthen Africa, Africa's health systems, maintain food supplies, avoid the deepening of the financial crisis, support education, protect jobs, keep households and businesses afloat, and cash on the continent against lost income and export earnings. She reminded us that on the 29th of April this year, African ministers of labor and social partners meeting uh, uh, in Addis uh, meeting under the auspice of the AU stated equivocally that without cushioning the mechanism through financial stimulus, there will be significant losses of jobs in Africa, particularly in the informal economy. The ministers further committed themselves to work together more urgently than ever before 
to minimize the health, economic, and employment impact of this crisis and prepare even for a brighter future of work. The Botswana Government COVID-19 Economic Advisory Committee carried out an evaluation of the potential economic impact on the country. The outcomes of that evaluation have formed the basis for the necessary government-supported social and economic plan, which has had to be designed to mitigate the impact of the pandemic across board. In fact, we import 90% of our medicine, medicals, pharmaceuticals, from outside the continent. And imagine that now we have disrupted global supply chains and some of the countries have imposed restrictions on the export of medical supplies. What do we do? So the question that you ask is more about looking inside and asking ourselves, what is it that we can do that can have an African solution? Um, you know, Africa is confronted with a, a, a double supply and demand shock that arrived in, in three successive waves. A first wave came from China through weakened trade channels and lower foreign direct investment, and to some extent, Dr. Piri um, related to that. Um, a second wave arrived from OECD countries uh, due to the EU demand slump associated with the lockdown and the halt in tourism. Um, most small island developing states, North African countries, as well as several West African economies depend on the European Union for at least 50% of their trade. Finally, a, a third wave came from the shock on internal demand and the slowdown of intra-African trade. The, the shock to internal demand has been driven by disruptions in household and business spending and particularly impacted countries with strict confinement measures such as South Africa. O desemprego, o subemprego, a informalidade, o déficit em termos de proteção social e a precariedade são grandes preocupações para muitos países africanos, pois os setores público e privado não produzem empregos adequados para absorverem a maioria da população a idade de trabalhar, particularmente os jovens recentemente formados e as mulheres. A maioria dos povos não tem outra solução que criar empregos alternativos para si mesmo. É isso que justifica o forte domínio da economia informal no continente. Reconduir em mieux après la crise sanitaire que j'espère va arriver en Afrique est un, est une thématique très pertinente, actuelle et interpellatrice. Elle invite l'ensemble du continent à redoubler d'efforts pour, pour retrouver son niveau de croissance d'avant la crise et aller au-delà. Ainsi, la mise en œuvre du cadre stratégique de l'OIT pour répondre à la pandémie devra faire de la promotion du travail décent une réalité en Afrique. لدعم أصحاب العمل والعمال ومساندتهم حتى يستطيعوا التغلب على تحديات الأزمة ومعالجة آثارها فقدمت الحكومة المصرية تسهيلات عديدة لأصحاب الأعمال لضمان الحفاظ على استمرار العمل بها وربطت بين الحصول على تلك الامتيازات والتسهيلات بالحفاظ على حقوق العمال واحترام معايير العمل الوطنية والدولي كما أطلق فقامة رئيس الجمهورية مبادرة لصرف منحة مالية للعمالة غير المنتظمة فضلا عن صرف مرتبات العمالة المنتظمة بالقطاعات المتضررة وعلى رأسها قطاع السياحة السيدات والسادة لقد شهد الاقتصاد المصري ينفو دونك باتير ان سيستم اكونوميك وسوسيال بلو رزيليا Et c'est bien dans cette perspective que la Côte d'Ivoire poursuit la mise en œuvre d'importants projets tels que la généralisation de la couverture maladie universelle et le déploiement du régime social des travailleurs indépendants. Over 12,000 workers have been temporarily laid off as a result of COVID-19. Government, through the support of the Swati National COVID-19 Fund, has set up a short-term relief fund for workers. Who have been laid off and thus has not been paid during the 
partial lockdown. This benefit will cover only two months. The ILO and the government of Swatin have collaborated to initiate an unemployment benefit scheme in Swatin. Normal business, normal business operations have been affected. It may take quite some time for some businesses to get back to usual potential. The perspective economic actual sounds très alarmant, surtout pour le secteur informel où l'offre de production s'élève à 70% contre 30% seulement pour le formel. Je saisis cette occasion pour porter à votre connaissance que le ministère du Travail a mis en place une commission tripartite et plus par arrêté numéro 2037 MG Fipsac Bar Cap en vue de recenser les entreprises et les secteurs informels les plus impactés par la pandémie pour ensuite Elaborate a plan uh, strategic accompaniment. COVID-19 has posed uh, both challenges and opportunities. We therefore, as African region, need strength and efforts to contain COVID-19. We must also seize opportunities that COVID-19 has revealed. To facilitate economic recovery, the international financial institutions should consider giving debt relief to developing countries. Cash transfers are not only one of the most impactful tools we have in development, they're particularly well suited to respond to this crisis by mitigating economic impacts on the most vulnerable and supporting adherence to quarantine and social distancing measures. Uh, countries are increasingly recognizing this and without doubt COVID-19 has accelerated the social protection and jobs agenda. Uh, many households are now more likely to fall into poverty as a direct consequence of the pandemic and uh, uh, more, many lost their jobs and particularly those working in the informal sector which represents 70 percent of the jobs that we have. Uh, women and girls obviously are disproportionately affected. Workers are the backbone of the society and the drive behind our country's economic growth and stability. The problem fundamental for Africa is the transformation of the economy African qui repose sur les euh, l'exportation des matières premières, les, les, les services et aussi l'informalité. Il y a aussi euh, donc il faut la transformer en euh, une économie durable qui euh, crée de la richesse et de l'emploi durable. En Algérie, l'expérience mise en place ces quatre dernières années a fait prévaloir l'utilisation de la couverture sociale comme vecteur d'intégration. Et j'insiste là-dessus. Cette démarche a permis de doubler le nombre d'affiliés cotisants à la Caisse Sécurité Sociale des travailleurs non salariés, dits indépendants. Nous sommes très conscients que la transition de l'économie informelle vers l'économie formelle ne peut et ne doit en aucun cas se réaliser par le biais de la coercition. Au Gabon, nous avons une politique d'entrepreneuriat jeune une véritable politique où nous accompagnons avec euh, des renforcements de capacité, des incubateurs, nous accompagnons ces jeunes et nous accompagnons également les femmes parce que nous avons observé que dans nos marchés, ce sont les femmes qui représentent la plus grande frange de, 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 du segment informel. Et euh, ça représente à peu près aujourd'hui sur l'ensemble du territoire, on peut dire 80%. The important thing is for us to render active support to the informal sector, SMEs, MSMEs. I know many African countries are already having financial support base for them to tap into. However, the major challenge that they have is retipism, that is bureaucracy. Many of them are even interested in tapping into the loans that are provided by government, do not have the opportunity because of several red tips that makes it difficult for them to access it. Quelle est la composition de ce secteur informel constitué essentiellement de jeunes? Or, la moyenne de nos, de, de nos populations aujourd'hui, c'est presque moins de 20, 24 ans. Sur d'autres pays même, c'est à partir de 20 ans, n'est-ce pas? Ensuite, c'est des femmes. Et la majorité de ceux qui interviennent dans le secteur informel euh, sont analphabètes, n'est-ce pas? Dans leur grande majorité. Donc, mettre l'accent sur l'éducation et la formation de nos, de nos, de nos, de nos, de nos jeunes faire en sorte qu'ils puissent être accompagnés, bénéficier de formations qualifiantes, n'est-ce pas Faire en sorte qu'ils puissent réellement euh, montrer leurs capacités et leurs talents. The main reason why enterprise choose to remain uh, informal arises from multiple 
procedures in applying for business registration, and hectic and restrict, which are hectic and restrictive, inadequate capital, expensive loans, lack of collateral to support the loan application, inadequate markets as a result of steep local competition, poor infrastructure, roads, power and water, and insufficient social protection. To address this, the government is uh, facing these challenges and going forward, we expect to see an increase in the number of enterprises that transit from informal to formal. This includes uh, uh, reduction in the number of bureaucracies involved, improvement of uh, business registration, minimum reducing the number of processes that we follow. We had a conditional cash register done by the World Bank with the government that had 2.6 million households. But uh, we discovered that with the lockdown, the number of people in the vulnerability group has increased, even though it's not uh, <laughs> double that number. So government had to increase the, 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 the register and now to now uh, give uh, food uh, stamp and uh, uh, cash to people through the conditional cash transfer. We have 76 um, percent of our labor force in the informal sector. Uh, most of these are young people between the ages of 20 and uh, 44, guided by the ILO's recommendation 204 on facilitating the transition from informal to, info, uh, to, to formal economy. Since the lifting uh, of the sanitary curfew on the 1st of June, the government has also decided to extend the wage assistance scheme and self-employed assistance scheme in the tourism and related sector, which are still heavily affected for the month of June. And we are working uh, in close collaboration with the sector for the coming month because we don't have an overview when activities will start in that particular sector. COVID-19 se verifica nos países de acolhimento da nossa diáspora e irá induzir a contração das remessas dos imigrantes. 3,5% do PIB em 2018, bem como das operações de capital público e privado e do investimento estrangeiro com destino para o país. As most women are the represented in the most represented in the informal economy, the serious need also for governments to look and push for ratification of the Convention 190 that has to protect against violence and harassment in the same informal economies. So a push towards informalization has to be taken serious. A push towards formalization has to be taken seriously so that the informal traders and workplaces are protected by the law. But the informal sector needs to be approached uh, in a differentiated manner. Uh, there are those who are informal by choice. Uh, now, the, those who are informal by choice are basically making doing business difficult for those who are formal. And they would rather maybe perhaps even fall back to informality because they're being undercut. So uh, the practical solution is to increase or strengthen enforcement of compliance. For instance, the issue of counterfeits. If that is addressed, then it will be unattractive for them uh, to continue to remain informed. For the impact on the health, the COVID-19 has gravely affected our economy through the measures restrictive that have been put in place in the majority of the countries. In addition, there is a lot of investment for the development in Africa. It should be supported by the shock of the COVID-19. Et pour certains de nos pays, il sera nécessaire d'initier et de mettre en œuvre des processus de relance économique pour soutenir les entreprises et ainsi éviter la récession. To expand the scope of social dialogue beyond the traditional areas of industrial relations to address economic and social policy issues. The crisis has exposed this gap and this need. So we as social partners need to step up to the plate and expand our conversation. In this regard, we want to commend several countries that have actually taken the initiative to sign memorandums of understanding or framework agreements on their own as social partners to help manage the crisis. And Kenya is one of them. My colleague who spoke earlier, Francis Atuli, I believe referred to it. But the reality is that if you look at the social dialogue structures in our continent, only a few countries 
have an institutional mechanism for involving social partners in policy issues outside of labor matters. So the ILO should assist its constituents to increase their capacity on social and economic key drivers, including those of productivity. Those lessons that the crisis has taught us, we must take seriously moving forward. Mm -hmm. And we would like to underline that as Africa, the common standards that we all cherish, we must also hold ourselves to these standards and not just meet to talk about them, but to develop the supervisory mechanism and monetary mechanisms to ensure that those standards that we hold dear and talk about, we are able to support each other to achieve those standards. One key takeaway from all the conversation we've had today is that the Centenary Declaration, the Abidjan Declaration, and the framework to guide our response to COVID-19 are very valuable and very relevant. That has come out very clearly. Partnerships at national levels, at continental levels, at global levels are paramount. We have to work together. Yeah, that was Cynthia last week and this is Cynthia live this week. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you for staying with us, uh, Cynthia. One could not overhear the one phrase, the one word, informal economy, the size of it, the volume, um, and therefore also associated with it, the 80% of women in the informal economy, uh, the high amount of young people working in it. So quite a challenge. Now, before we started with the video I did interrupt you slightly um, at something that excited you very much um, the two projects uh, that uh, you are undertaking together with a number of international organizations both in Mozambique and on the other side in Tunisia so what is actually sort of uh, your own takeaway from the event last week and the outlook and the hope that you connect to the two projects Thank you very much, Connie. Um, when I talked about the excitement, it's, it's when you see innovation, when you find new ways of addressing fairly old problems. So we are very, very excited about it in, in the country as well. Let me start with the um, Tunisian example. First, the legislative framework, the very first on the social and solidarity economy, economy was done through social dialogue, effective social dialogue, right through. And this is very relevant to a lot of the issues that came up during the conversations last week. And the focus was to ensure that the social and solidarity economy contributes not only to job creation, but boosting economic economic growth in a way that is anchored on social dialogue. So this is uh, quite important. For Mozambique, the World Bank representative in the synopsis that was captured already talked about the key dimension, the new thing concerning it. A lot of the cash transfers tend to be short term, focused on meeting immediate needs. The innovation here, the, 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 the new, the addition to this is that we can actually use cash transfers as effective means of not just meeting the immediate needs, but helping to strengthen the social protection systems. Now, what are the key takeaways from last week? One, the issue of social dialogue. That came up as a very, very important area that we need to support our member states, we need to support our social partners with. Social dialogue is, in, is crucial and indispensable for not just effective national responses to COVID and other um, national issues, but also at the sectoral and, and, uh, and enterprise level. The issue of the informal economy, you talked about it already. That came out in different forms, in different dimensions. And so the transformation of the informal economy is a major priority for Africa, a major area where we'll work with other partners and we're already doing that to ensure that we strengthen the capacities of our, of our, 
countries to be able to do this. And we'll build on the very good practices from Tunisia, from Mozambique. In fact, other countries are already in the pipeline to, to be able to learn from the Tunisian experience. Another key thing that, that came up, and, and, and this is something that bears repeating, the Abidjan Declaration that was adopted last year by our member states uh, in, in December is still very, very relevant and provides a solid basis for addressing the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19, which is human-centered and promotes a very inclusive response. Universal social protection and good governance of social protection systems must be a priority. That came out from all our social partners, from the governments, that without this, we will not be able to build back, not to talk of building back better. Issues around gender. Gender remains a key dimension that must be addressed during the recovery. Women have to be prioritized in this recovery uh, interventions, as well as young people. Africa is a very youthful continent. So whatever it is that we're doing has to have the face of a young person and women have to be prioritized. Last but not the least, issues around skills. Skills development, including technology adoption. These are important in building a brighter and better future of work in Africa. And then last, but also quite crucial, and I heard this in from my counterparts from Asia, from Arab states, partnerships. Partnerships with the continental organization, the African Union, partnerships with our development banks, with the African Development Bank and the World Bank and other financial institutions, but also partnership within the UN family at the regional level and at the country level and partnership with all our development partners. These were quite a lot of the issues that came up. And let me use this opportunity to really thank all the ministers who attended in such a huge number, the highest level of our social partners who were engaged and who stayed on for a four hour conversation. This is just a quick synopsis of the key takeaways from the rich and very vibrant conversation we had last week. Thanks, Connie. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for sharing. And um, I think uh, we take away that with your heart and your energy, uh, you will be able to move a lot of things in connection with all the partners that you've uh, just uh, pointed out to us. And with that, we uh, turn our eyes uh, to Europe and uh, Central Asia. But again, uh, before we introduce uh, the Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia, Heinz Koller, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of voices of people from the ground that are experiencing COVID-19 and that, of course, are suffering from it in their work life. I think personally I've learned a lot from living through this pandemic so far. A lot about my personal adaptability and my ability to still work and produce the work that's needed. But also being on furlough I've really learned about the importance of work to me, for my um, feelings of usefulness, for my purpose, um, for my mental health and lots of different things that I really didn't appreciate the fact that I had a job before. От появата на пандемијата, ние како компанија што се занимава со производство на плочест мебел, реално имаме претрпено големи загуби. А, тоа придонесува да се намали обемот на самата работа и на платата. А, голем проблем кој што веќе три месеци е присатен. А, сето тоа придонесува да ни се намалат приходите, да се намали обемот на работата, а уште поголем проблем е што балансот семейството со работата е нарушен до еден степен во кој што да кажам дека веќе е и критич. В связи со оптимизација и сокращение многих врачеви медсестер, очень очень возросла нагрузка. Нагрузка возросла колоссально, потому что люди в тревоге и все бегут к психиатру. Напряженная ситуация на работе влияет на жизнь, то есть ты приходишь домой, тебе нужно быть мамой, тебе нужно быть женой, тебе нужно быть активной, веселой и всех вдохновлять своим примером, потому что дома все точно так же страдают от ситуации в мире, от 
тревоги от неопределенности, от страхов. Очень плохо, потому что закрыли ресторан. Нету народ. Мы, я говорю, это мы дома сидели без работы. Деньгами очень проблема. Мы не работали. Начальство они помогали за квартирой. Потом у нас там ну, надо тоже деньги надо отправить. У нас семья там, дома, родины. to say hello in Geneva to Heinz Koller, the ILO Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia. Uh, Heinz, we've just heard a couple of Vox Pop, a couple of people from around the region. What is it that you are hearing? Yeah, thank you very much, Connie, for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. First of all, I think the four voices you heard, they give a pretty good flavor what's going on in the region. And in particular, because it's geographically very balanced, we heard it from Western Europe, from Eastern Europe, from the Western Balkans and from Central Asia. So I think that's a pretty good picture. Before I go into it first, uh, I would like to point at the kind of magnitude of the challenge we have ahead of us. Basically, according to the fifth monitor of the, uh, of the ILO, uh, we have a reduction in hours worked in our region of 13.9%, which means 45 million jobs less in the second quarter of 2020 compared to 2019. This is something. The statements clearly highlight where the challenges are. For workers, they have to cope with a reduction in their salary, they might be on furlough or they might even be unemployed. In particular for macro, small and medium sized enterprises, it's really a question of their existence and obviously also of the existence of the workers in those companies, but also obviously for the employers. Thirdly, vulnerable groups like migrant workers, the cook from Tajikistan, I mean, he seems to be lucky that his employer is looking after him because probably he would not be covered by social protection. And he has the problem that he has to send home remittances, which are likely to be the only source of income from his family. And also, by the way, a major contribution to the economy in his home country. And lastly, health sector, structurally very weak, savings in the past. People working there, understaffed, underpaid, and probably even worse, undervalued. So those are the kind of challenges which we are facing. There are a few other challenges which have not been in those voices. Number one, problems in the informal sector. Number two, problems in the so-called non-standard form of work like the gig economy. Number three, which came out a little bit, the backlash for women who are working usually in sectors which are most hit by the crisis and in, in addition have to do non-paid care work. Young people and older people are massively affected as well from the crisis. One thing which came not out at all is the following, which is very important to the ILO. That is, under the pretext of COVID-19 crisis response, there is in certain countries a lack of respect for social dialogue, for fundamental principles and rights for employers and workers, and for core labor standards. Let me be very clear. Social dialogue, fundamental principles and rights at work, core labor standards are not part of the problem they are part of the solution. That In other words, to sum up, there's a lot to be done to come back to a new and better normal. Over to you, Connie. Thank you, Sorry, I, I assume you were already uh, done. Now, um, you already sort of said that that is part of the solution. So I'm assuming that that is one of uh, the arrows that uh, you have sort of uh, in your um, uh, shooting array. Um, what else? Um, first of all, the response 
of the world of work, if you like, in my region has been actually quite encouraging. We have seen massive stimulus packages uh, in order to support enterprises, in order to support jobs, in order to support income, in order to provide adequate social protection. I think that's the good news for my region. And we as the ILO have come up with this four pillars of our ILO response, which provide an excellent framework as well for all the responses. The DG explained it in the beginning. I have to say, due to our network on the ground in our country offices, we have been able to link up very closely with our constituents, with governments and social partners. And I hope we were able to be helpful for them. First of all, in the beginning of the crisis, there was this big request for good practices from other governments. Therefore, we established this dedicated database to give everybody the possibility to look what the others are doing. So this exchange of best practice has, quite, has worked quite well and there were loads of hits and there were really frequently visited databases. Secondly, there was a huge demand for rapid labor market impact assessments. So the ILO piloted a tool with about a dozen countries uh, in our region from Portugal through the Western Balkans with, together with the EBRD to the Central Asia to actually identify what's working well, where are the gaps, what are the follow-up measures. Third was social protection. We heard that from other regions as well. So we provided a tool where you could actually assess the validity of social protection systems and in particular assess the costs of extending social protection systems and that was very much appreciated. And fourthly, occupational safety and health. During the crisis but also now in the recovery phase with regard to return of office. All in all, this is ongoing work. We are now in a kind of phase where we come out of the actual crisis in many countries and where we go into the recovery support. But obviously, we will be continuing to assist our constituents. Over to you, Connie. Thank you very much for sharing. And I believe that, uh, of course, uh, making informed decisions simply because you have uh, decent information at hand uh, must be uh, very good uh, for the tripartite uh, forces that are working in the countries. And uh, we had uh, the event uh, last week and Wednesday it was hosted in Geneva. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we can have a look at the 20 minute highlights uh, from that event. It's my great pleasure to also welcome you to this regional event for Europe and Central Asia as part of the ILO Global Summit on COVID-19 and the World of Work. Обеспечить порядок основанный на экономической справедливости, демократическом участии и равноправие то, что мы называем общественным договором. Первостепенная задача в мире и в регионе Европы и Средней, Средней Азии. I think the first and biggest challenge now, the most immediate challenge is to make sure that we can have a safe return back to work because many people in many countries, uh, workers are still um, on telework or on short time or unemployed indeed. Um, many uh, supply chains are disrupted still and we need to go back to economic activity and back to work uh, as uh, safely as possible. The pandemic has challenged uh, workplaces to quickly adapt to the situation, not least in the health and long-term care sectors, including elderly care. It will be important to examine what role working conditions, forms of employment and ways of organizing work has played during this pandemic. 
good and fair working conditions should apply to all workers in the labor market. Our policy action needs to be based on the international labor standards and focus on the role of decent work in achieving a sustainable and equitable recovery in line with the 2030 development agenda. Now that the global economy is sliding into a recession, the devastating impact of the pandemic uh, on employment also comes at uh, a time of worrying political development. Uh, Luca Vicentini from the ITUC mentioned that as well, but I would like to also say a few words about it. We saw in the recently published uh, ITUC Global Rights Index uh, how authoritarian governments increasingly oppose on trade union rights and harass and persecute trade unions to undermine them. And this is entirely the wrong response, of course, for many reasons. And the response to this crisis must be built uh, upon uh, social uh, dialogue. Um, uh, we know uh, this is the best tool uh, to achieve inclusive and sustainable strategies and actions. But the crisis is not yet over and we will face the consequences in the future. Therefore, our task is to create conditions for a value transformation to green economy, a balanced development of innovative and sustainable enterprises and social stability for our people with human-centered approach, which was at the, the heart of ILO Centenary Declaration. With the spread of the telework arrangements uh, to almost all sectors of the economy, well, regulating and protecting telework becomes a must. Me gustaría comenzar por los aprendizajes comunes por la necesidad de tomar nota de los errores y abordar esta crisis de una forma mejor y más eficaz que la anterior. Las viejas fórmulas ya aplicadas no nos sirven. No nos sirve la austeridad ni el sálvese quien pueda. Estos meses nos han valido para comprender el valor de lo esencial, la salud y los trabajos que nos han permitido salvar vidas. Hemos comprendido la necesidad de poner la vida en el centro, la conciliación y los cuidados, de forma que los ciclos del trabajo y los de las personas se acompasen armónicamente. La declaración del centenario lo sintetiza cuando dice desarrollar su enfoque del mundo del trabajo centrado en las personas. Mi propuesta se resume en una frase. El trabajo decente debe estar en el corazón de la reconstrucción. El trabajo decente es una feliz expresión que resume nuestras aspiraciones como OIT, empleo estable y de calidad, seguro y saludable, con derechos y sin desigualdades, con salarios dignos que permitan sacar adelante una familia. Reconstrucción significa construir de nuevo, es recuperar lo esencial, lo valioso para la vida y para el trabajo. Volver a la normalidad no puede significar volver a la precariedad. Necesitamos seguridad en el ámbito laboral, en la salud, en los contratos, en la evolución profesional, seguridad para la vida. Necesitamos certezas en momentos de crisis. Многие предприниматели, конечно же, прибегали не только к сокращению рабочих мест, владели неполный режим рабочего времени, но и начали интенсивно использовать перевод работнику временно на дистанционную форму труда и там, где это позволяли производственные условия, это было достаточно эффективной мерой, но, но для этого нужно нам определиться, а чем нормируется этот дистанционный труд и насколько МОД сегодня уже имеет инструменты y aquí sí que quiero, esto es, un, esto es una cumbre de la OIT y sí que quiero llamar la atención sobre la necesidad y sobre la, la urgencia de que no solamente España, sino el resto de estados que todavía no lo han hecho, ratifiquen el convenio 189 de OIT, porque las personas que se dedican al trabajo doméstico deben tener equiparación de derechos al resto de trabajadores para evitar los abusos, la economía informal que les deja sin protección y los riesgos laborales a los que están expuestos.
procuramos desde logo e sempre assumir o diálogo social como uma peça-chave na construção de todas estas medidas, isso tem sido essencial. All this cannot happen without proper involvement of social partners and without proper social dialogue, without proper workplace democracy, without proper collective bargaining and industrial relations. We have also seen in this uh, crisis how important and how critical the dialogue and cooperation are. No government would have been able to respond without dialogue and cooperation with the main stakeholders, with employers, with the trade unions. The ability of representative organizations to mobilize the views of their real economy and put together proposals and solutions in hours and days should not be underestimated. In extraordinary times, close collaboration and dialogue between employers and workers can help boost economic and social progress. Switzerland is convinced that this is a crucial that this is crucial for effective and solidly united actions. With the ILO, we adapted our programs and interventions for small and medium enterprises and in supply chains to support the economic recovery. While representing respecting workplace safety measures, we will continue to support the ILO's action to lessen the impact of the pandemic. In this new reality, the importance of effective social dialogue and sound industrial relations has become even stronger. In times of crisis, social dialogue can play a key role in making workplaces safe, absorbing shocks, preserving employment uh, and supporting transition. Our Department of Industry and Employment Relations implemented various measures to ensure that it operated in an efficient manner in dealing with claims of breaches of working conditions, as well as allowing employers to implement temporary short-time working conditions so as to avoid redundancy. So flexibility in this case really worked. So 25,500 jobs out of 250,000 were saved by these measures adopted by the department. I conclude by saying that it was important to have constant consultation between the social partners, which resulted in past action being taken on the ground uh, based on the situation as it evolved. So social dialogue here uh, really was crucial. The system and norm mode фундаментальные права в сфере труда, социальный диалог, уникальная архитектура, доказавшая свою эффективность и в кризисные годы. Deshalb müssen wir mehr denn je sicherstellen, dass technologischer Fortschritt und sozialer Fortschritt Hand in Hand gehen. Das hat auch die ILO in ihrer Jahrhunderterklärung im vergangenen Jahr 2019 sehr, sehr deutlich unterstrichen. Sozialer Fortschritt heißt zum Beispiel, dass alle Beschäftigten den Zugang zur Qualifizierung haben müssen, damit sie fit sind für die Jobs von morgen, damit die Beschäftigten von heute auch die Chance haben, die Arbeit von morgen zu machen. Zunächst aber geht es jetzt um die Jobs von heute, um die wir kämpfen müssen. Decent work doesn't work um, without decent employment. And we, for having decent employment, we have to have companies that are able to survive, that are sustainable, that thrive again. So we need to make, um, um, uh, in, to, to, uh, to develop policies that help employers get back on track, get back into the markets, get back into production, um, and workers get back to work, and hopefully a better work indeed, as everybody has said. And share with you what we've been doing always with this goal and mindset, which is maintain jobs. This is for us critical, maintain jobs, supporting enterprises for this, uh, and maintain income in families. For those who are under the threat of unemployment or have already lost their work, in July we have organized an education. We have faced a long period of unemployment, unemployment days, И, безусловно, это тоже сказалось на бизнесе, и бизнес нуждался в поддержке, которую правительство оказало. И хотел бы сказать о широких программах поддержки ведущих российских компаний, которые оказывали поддержку не только своему персоналу, 
но э, компании очень активно присутствовали э, в региональных сообществах, помогая в том числе и э, системе здравоохранения. Криамс, uma medida especial para quem tinha ficado fora do sistema, seja trabalhadores independentes que não estavam a conseguir entrar nos, nas medidas de apoio extraordinária, seja uh, uma medida nova que criamos para os trabalhadores informais que estão fora do sistema. É uma medida claramente de inclusão no, na economia formal do sistema formal de proteção social, uh, claramente é fundamental, temos redes de proteção e de segurança social fortes, eficazes, robustas, e com capacidade de resposta rápida. Esse é cada vez mais crítico e iluminante também tudo aqui existe de red tape, que muitas vezes se transformam os sistemas em sistemas mais que excluem em vez de incluir. Дополнительно мы пересмотрели подход к организации молодежной занятости. Сейчас в России создается единый сервис практики стажировок на базе которого будет действовать мониторинг профессиональной траектории выпускников. Сервис позволит обеспечить студентов первым профессиональным опытом, что станет гарантией более успешного трудоустройства и закрепления на рабочем, на рабочем месте после обучения. В перспективе сервис позволит нам оценить конкурентоспособность каждой конкретной образовательной программы и повысить качество обучения. In few months, uh, we have destroyed three times the number of jobs uh, that were destroyed by the financial crisis in five years. Uh, uh, so this is really uh, a big challenge for all of us uh, to try to overcome. Of course, as I said, uh, uh, two thirds, maybe three quarters of uh, these jobs are actually only suspended from the, for the moment. Uh, but we have to be very careful and attentive because if we don't put in place uh, immediate and also, also long-term measures, uh, the risk that these uh, tens million jobs will be uh, turned into permanent unemployment uh, is very uh, high. After taking into account the new challenges, both for health and safety at the workplaces, but also at the public health sphere. Are the boundaries moving? And how we keep uh, uh, the boundaries and the responsibilities in the balance for workers, for employers, and for the public health systems? And uh, how can the safety and health institutions better prepare ourselves and the society for the future crisis. Because the young risk to be the first victims of this crisis, perhaps not on the health side, but on the side of the economic and social consequences. This has, by the way, been pointed out very early by the ILO. And therefore, the European Union wants to reinforce the youth guarantee giving every young person the right measures to either find a job or find the right skilling and training. We uh, have proposed today an updated skills agenda because the change and the transformation of work uh, makes out of skills a key element to have a fair management of this transformation. And we have made proposals for strengthening vocational education and training in Europe. Young people are hard hit by this crisis. More than one, and this is I think also a figure coming from the ILO, more than one in six young people have stopped working. It must be our priority to support youth employment from the onset. The Perk Women community is extremely concerned about the devastating impact of the crisis on the world of work and especially about the gender impact of uh, COVID-19. So the ratification of ILO Convention 190 and recommendation 206 must be a priority on the political agendas everywhere. But for the first time, there is a global instrument that includes the, protect, the protection in cases of domestic violence linked with the work of work. Und wir müssen den Arbeitsschutz noch viel stärker zu einem internationalen Thema machen. Denn dieser Krise ist deutlich geworden, unzureichender Arbeits- und Gesundheitsschutz. Das ist eine Gefahr für Leib und Leben von Beschäftigten und ein allgemeines Gesundheitsrisiko. Das haben wir im Bereich der Saisonarbeitskräfte in Europa erlebt und wir erleben es aktuell in Deutschland in der Fleischindustrie. 
finde übrigens, Corona hat klar gezeigt, dass Arbeitsschutz zu den Kernarbeitsnormen der ILO gehören muss. Защита трудовых прав работников, в том числе гигиена труда, обеспечение безопасности и охраны труда на рабочих местах в условиях пандемии на фоне борьбы с распространением коронавируса явилась актуальной для всего мирового сообщества. Health and safety should be a fundamental right. COVID-19 has put the spotlight on the importance of occupational health, uh, health and safety for workers' well-being. In its best moments, working life is a way for people to realize their dreams. But to have a job is not enough. It is also required that the work is decent, with attached rights, and that work conditions are sound. Many times accidents and illnesses in working life are possible to prevent, and this should be a central part, a part of the work for social justice. За период пандемии мы еще раз убедились о необходимости качественного пересмотра действующего закона об охране труда. Пятых, я хочу отметить, что мы уделяем особое внимание имплементации в национальное законодательство международных норм в сфере достойного труда, следуя принципам обеспечения социальной справедливости и достойного труда, отраженным в декларации столетия МОД о будущем сфере труда. В 2020 году мы планируем присоединение еще к трем конвенциям МОД, а именно в области охраны труда. The most important is we got the confidence from our minister that we could set the rules. So basically we were given a mandate, a green light to together work out the rules. ILO is very instrumental in national employment strategy and also in Azerbaijan in developing in general public employment service and also the recent visits of ILO high level uh, management to Azerbaijan helped to identify such important areas as a transition from informal economy to formal self-employment promotion and also harmonizing economic and demographic trends. Wir werden die Folge der internationalen Corona-Krise auch nicht national allein bewältigen können, auch nicht allein europäisch. Wir müssen global zusammenarbeiten. Dabei ist die ILO ein starker Partner an unserer Seite. Sei es beim Vision Zero Fund, sei es bei der sozialen Mindestsicherung. Die ILO-Empfehlungen zum sozialen Basisschutz sind für uns da eine ganz wichtige Orientierungsmarke. Oder sei es, wenn es darum geht, aus digitalem Wandel sozialen Fortschritt zu machen. Ich versichere Ihnen, Deutschland wird im Rahmen der EU-Ratspräsidentschaft alles dafür tun, um multilaterales Handeln zu stärken. Нам всем еще предстоит длинный путь к возвращению сферы труда и до кризисному уровню, но сотрудничество в рамках международной организации труда позволит сделать эту работу более эффективной. And for the ILO level, uh, colleagues have already referred to the centenary declaration. This is really of huge importance, and my proposal would be that we should as European and Central Asian region, we should really um, make a strong impact on the global level discussions and ask for this centenary declaration to be now taken as a basis to develop at ILO level the global instruments that are suited to create decent work. We were really, really happy that we had a truly pan-European discussion today with representatives from all parts of our region. And it's not every day that we, that we are able to say that we even had a fair tripartite, gender and geographical balance. It showed that the centenary declaration and its content has passed the reality test of the COVID crisis. Stay safe and stay connected. Yes, and we're now connected live to Heinz uh, in Geneva this week. Uh, Heinz, as I was listening, um, I had the impression that some of the issues that we've heard before, like the women stroke gender issue, the consequences of COVID-19 on that particular aspect, was also a European Central Asian issue. Uh, we've had the aspect of youth uh, being uh, very important, but mostly what I heard was actually some satisfaction 
satisfaction in that the social dialogue is a proven instrument of getting things done, of living with a crisis, of actually getting forward. And there were also a couple of noises like we should do this in addition uh, when we get out of the crisis. What were your impressions? Yeah, thank you very much, Connie. Um, indeed, I think what came out very clearly from the conversation was, first of all, the relevance of the centenary declaration and underlying the relevance of the structure of the ILO. So in other words, our tripartite structure, so the high importance of social dialogue. And there, I think we have seen many, many examples in the region where social dialogue helped to form policies national employment policies and where it helped to find solutions and where it helped to create ownership by the government and by the social partner, which is a very important fundament for implementing things afterwards. I think also that the normative aspect of the ILO, which is also enshrined in the Centenary Declaration, is a very important one. You were talking about women's rights, gender equality. We heard calls for the uh, ratification of Convention 190 on violence and harassment at work. We heard calls to upgrade occupational safety and health conventions to become fundamental principles and rights at work. That just does show me, being a lawyer on top of it, that the normative agenda of the ILO is very much in demand. And maybe the third aspect also is the ILO as a development agency, which is simply an expression of the fact that we represent solidarity, multilateral cooperation, and just the fact that we are able to promote with the help of donors, our principles, our core values globally, and we were assured of the support from a major organization like the German EU presidency and the European Commission. And I also think this expression of solidarity came out very strongly throughout our regional event. That leaves me to thank all ministers, all representatives from the social partners who contributed to our event, but also all the people working behind the scenes. After all, we are the ILO and therefore we should also be grateful for the people who are helping us and assisting us. Thank you very much. Back to you, Connie. Thank you very much, and especially to the interpreters who had to actually hang on for another half an hour within their working time, uh, but who had to do a little bit more work because everybody was so full of it. Um, so uh, that was sort of the review to last week, Europe and Central Asia event. Now we're looking at the Americas. And again, that event there was uh, hosted in Lima, but in the end, we all know it doesn't really matter where it's hosted because simply we are all online, we're all digital, we're all virtual, but the good thing is we are together. And just as everybody else, um, uh, the Americas have prepared a Vox Pop, a, a video showing what people on the ground uh, are doing in order to cope with COVID-19. ¿Cómo ha afectado el COVID-19 en mi vida? Me ha, me ha afectado de una manera muy traumática, ya que me encuentro en mi casa sin trabajo y sin disfrute de salario. Yo como trabajadora doméstica puedo ver que si cada día nosotras como trabajadoras domésticas no podemos capacitarnos para enfrentar los nuevos desafíos y nuevos retos que se nos presenten, estaremos prácticamente sentadas en un banco sin ninguna esperanza. A pandemia está afetando diretamente 
nas comunidades indígenas e nesse momento o mundo do Pará não está não tá vindo pessoas para dentro da nossa aldeia comprar o nosso artesanato. A gente vive da venda do artesanato. Em nome da nossa aldeia eu venho agradecer esse projeto que é tão importante e vem trazer cada vez mais a energia para a nossa segurança alimentar dentro da nossa aldeia. En un principio, claro que tuvo un impacto muy fuerte, sin ir más lejos, paralizó toda la actividad notarial y generó sin dudas un sentimiento de fuerte incertidumbre a nivel laboral. Hoy, afortunadamente, estamos trabajando con cierta normalidad mediante protocolos y ciertas medidas sanitarias. Imagino y espero un futuro en el que el trabajo, en todas sus áreas, por supuesto, y de la mano de la tecnología, resulte siempre indemne frente a cualquier contexto. Bueno, de hecho, nuestro año había comenzado bastante bien. Teníamos una proyección de ventas bastante alta. Sin embargo, con la llegada pues, de la pandemia, nuestros clientes más importantes empezaron a cancelar algunos de los eventos que teníamos ya programados. Esto nos ha permitido reinventarnos porque hemos buscado la manera de llegar a los colaboradores y a los clientes de, de nuestros clientes de una manera diferente, ¿no? esta vez de manera virtual. Vemos un futuro con buenos ojos, dado que esta reinvención nos está ayudando también a ampliar nuestro rango de servicios. Dramatic, difficult, not uh, the old normal, uh, certainly unusual. Uh, those were some attributes we just heard in the Vox Pops, and uh, I am now very happy to greet uh, Vicinius, Vinicius uh, Pinheiro, ILO Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, now, good morning to you because I think sort of physically located, you are in New York, and it's quite good to know that uh, even in these digital times, people are sort of have a place on which they are on this uh, planet Earth. Now, uh, Vinicius, um, those were the couple of attributes that I heard from these statements. What do you hear? Well, thank you so much, Connie. I'm going to speak in Spanish because this is the language that is spoken for by the majority of the, of the region. Uh, estos eh, testimonios eh, demuestran claramente cómo la pandemia ha servido, por un lado, para acelerar tendencias relacionadas con el futuro de trabajo, como el pasaje al teletrabajo, la digitalización, automación, y por otro lado, para exacerbar problemas estructurales como la informalidad, la desigualdad, las brechas de acceso al protección social, a los servicios públicos y a la infraestructura, y especial la infraestructura digital. Diego, por ejemplo, el único empresario peruano fue capaz de transformar muy rápidamente un negocio de organización de eventos, que ya no es viable, por supuesto, por cuenta del confinamiento, en una empresa de prestación de servicios digitales y de promoción de comercio en línea, apoyando además a las empresas a mercadear sus productos en el mundo virtual. Entonces, una combinación de emprendedorismo, conocimientos y competencias, algún capital, por supuesto, de de negocios y acceso a tecnología fueran determinantes ¿no? para su estrategia. Desafortunadamente, eso no es eh, el caso de la gran parte de las empresas. ¿no? Se estima que más de 2,7 millones de empresas, en especial micro y pequeñas empresas, eh, van a desaparecer en la región este año, lo que significará una pérdida de 8,5 millones de puestos de trabajo. La situación de economía informal es todavía más preocupante en razón de la, de la implementación de las políticas de confinamiento obligatorio. Para muchos que han sobrevivido, la única esperanza que no esté disponible la vacuna es la reactivación productiva con trabajo decente eh, bajo nuevos estándares de, de salud eh, y seguridad en trabajo. Y eso es el caso precisamente del testimonio de, de María Rosario, la joven abogada notaria de Argentina, que es un representante de la generación de confinamiento que hablábamos anteriormente. En principio pensaba que iba a perder su empleo, pero después de regresar al trabajo tomando las precauciones necesarias, eh, eh, ya, eh, ya está eh, de vuelta, ¿no? así que demuestra cómo la seguridad del trabajo es un instrumento fundamental que contribuye al mismo tiempo para salvar vidas, eh, empleos y empresas. El testimonio de Lilian eh, Marrero, que es la empleada doméstica de Guatemala, empleada del hogar, ilustra muy bien cómo la pandemia ha 
Cristo e exaltado as vulnerabilidades de milhões de pessoas na região. A pandemia chega eh, em avião, em cruzeiros, se alastra por el bus, por el metro, por el transporte público, por el merc no mercado, en el mercado, las que no tienen condiciones adecuadas. El virus no discrimina, pero las capacidades de, de protegerse, de confinarse, de seguir trabajando y mantener ingreso eh, son muy distintas. Así que eh, las salvadoras del lugar, eh, en su gran mayoría mujeres, eh, están entre los grupos más vulnerables. Viste que ella quería hacer un curso ¿no? de formación, aprovechar la oportunidad para, para, para cambiar la estructura, pero eso desafortunadamente no, no, no es, no es eh, ofrecido para ella. Eh, entonces, de nuevo, esas características eh, también tienen que ser institucionales, ¿no? Con respecto a los grupos más vulnerables. Finalmente, eh, eh, entre los grupos más vulnerables están precisamente los pueblos indígenas tribales, y por eso el testimonio de Edna Chayamanawa es tan fundamental. Su voz se presenta cerca de 55 millones de indígenas, hombres y mujeres que viven en la región, que a la cara más nefasta de la pandemia es precisamente la cara de la desigualdad, porque la enfermedad y sus consecuencias sociales y económicas afectan más a los que menos tienen, pues no son, son los pueblos indígenas y tribales, quienes a menudo tampoco care, eh, tienen protección social y suelen tener un, un, un acceso limitado a cualquier tipo de atención basada. Así que los cuatro testimonios de COVID son una clara demostración de cómo el COVID ha funcionado al mismo tiempo como un acelerador de tendencias del futuro trabajo y un aumentador de las fracturas sociales. Thank you very much, uh, Vinicius, to take us along um, and uh, show us the full spectrum of the picture uh, in the Americas. Uh, maybe you could sort of uh, share with us how the ILO responds, um, what you can do, what you did do. Exacto. Es importante resaltar que el empleo y la protección social desde el inicio de la pandemia estuvieron en el corazón de la respuesta. Los mismos decretos que impusieron eh, cuarentenas, de cierre de fronteras, también tenían que traer medidas para sostener las empresas, los empleos, los ingresos. Y la OIT estuvo cerca de los ministros, de los eh, nuestros trabajadores y empleadores desde el inicio. ¿no? Y es importante reconocer el rol de los ministros y de nuestros sindicalistas y representantes gremiales, que son como trabajadores esenciales. ¿no? Entonces, eh, nosotros hemos acompañado eh, todo lo que tiene que ver con las implementaciones de las políticas de man mantenimiento de las empresas de eh, empleo, que es el eh, de mantenimiento del trabajo social. Eh, hemos eh, en especial trabajado en la reactivación del diálogo social, ¿no? porque con el pasaje al teletrabajo, al confinamiento, algo se perdió ¿no? en la capacidad eh, de estados eh, de, 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 de políticas ¿no? que, 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 que sean consensuales estaba basado en la, el carácter emergencial, pero entonces hicimos un trabajo de reactivación de virtuales, y son las empresas virtuales que fueron organizadas por, por toda, la, toda la América Latina y el Caribe, y también eternos como Panamá y Argentina que, que están estableciendo sus mesas de diálogo de partido. Apoyo a, a los gobiernos eh, mandantes con respecto a políticas de incentivas de empresas, eh, que, por ejemplo, eh, eh, Honduras, Perú, que hicimos programas para para apoyar directamente planes de continuidad para para pequeñas empresas. En Brasil, por ejemplo, apoyamos la formación de, de cooperativas de mujeres para la producción de mascarillas, eh, que, que hay un, un proceso de gestión productiva. Eh, apoyamos planes de, de protección social, como en Costa Rica, en que si apoyamos el gobierno en desarrollar una aplicación móvil para llegar a los eh, beneficiarios. En Perú, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, apoyamos la inserción laboral de trabajadores eh, migrantes y refugiados. Un, un segundo punto importante tiene que ver con la salud y el trabajo, trabajo que ha sido mencionado anteriormente. O sea, la, la idea es que el mundo de trabajo será totalmente distinto o sea, de lo que era antes, ¿no? en especial mientras no sea no esté desarrollado. Entonces, seguimos, eh, preparamos guías eh, que están eh, en especial por ejemplo, para inmigrantes en Costa Rica, Bol eh, Bolivia, en México, eh, en, en Haití por intermedio del programa Better Work, mejor, mejores trabajos, apoyamos cerca de 50 mil trabajadores ¿no? en términos de medidas de, de, de salud y seguridad de, de trabajo. ¿no? Y eso es importante, porque en Haití no trata, se trata solamente de dar apoyo monetario, pero darles también la clave para, 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 para el comercio, para, para la exportación. 
importante resaltar también el apoyo eh, en términos de curación de las, de las entidades de formación profesional y quería resaltar en especial el rol eh, que ha jugado Sintefor ¿no? en, este, en este proceso. Apoyo a, a, a iniciativas de cambios legislativos, en especial la regulación del teletrabajo eh, 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 de licencias eh, de salud. Y finalmente, eh, eh, apoyo a, a la elaboración de, de, de políticas para grupos vulnerables. ¿no? Para el futuro es fundamental que estemos presentes, en especial en los procesos de reestructuración productiva, incremento de la productividad que se van a llevar a cabo en los países. Y por eso estamos trabajando en la realidad de estudios y también de alianzas con nuestros eh, colegas de las Naciones Unidas y eh, 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 organismos financieros internacionales. Thank you so much, Vinicius. Um, and uh, as with everybody else, uh, you have, uh, and your team, of course, have put together a 20-minute excerpt from that four-hour regional day that you had in the Americas last week. So let's have a look at the highlights. Quería empezar esta discusión eh, con tres números, 5,1, 9,4 y 41. El 5,1 son los 5,1 millones de casos que se han registrado hasta el fin del mes eh, en las Américas. ¿no? Y eso es más que la mitad de, de los casos de COVID del mundo. El 9,4 es la última proyección del Fondo Monetario Internacional de retracción del PIB eh, en la región, en América Latina y el Caribe. Y la última cifra es 41, que en verdad son 41 millones, que, son, que es el número de desocupados en América Latina y el Caribe proyectado para este año por la OIT. Impacto de la pandemia. Antes que nada, recordar siempre que detrás de los números de esta tragedia que estamos viviendo hay cientos de miles seres humanos, millones, los trabajos, emprendimientos y vidas hoy están atravesando una situación realmente dramática. Me parece que es bueno decir que eh, detrás de los números están las personas y, y obviamente eso es parte de la preocupación de la OIT y también de, de los gobiernos. COVID-19 ha sido particularmente difícil para las regiones pequeñas como Barbados. Our region, the Caribbean region, is maybe the most tourism developed and dependent region in all of the world. Nosotros ya conocemos los efectos dramáticos de la pandemia para el mundo, los efectos económicos y sociales, el aumento de la pobreza, los impactos del empleo. El informe de la OIT estima 400 millones de desempleados en el mundo. Vinicius habló de las cifras aquí de las Américas. El impacto sobre las empresas, el aumento de la informalidad y la caída brusca de la renta y de los salarios. Ya conocemos uh, muy bien los estudios, muy bien hechos por la CEPAL, sobre el impacto del crecimiento, el decrecimiento económico de la región. Aquí en la región, nosotros acompañamos el día a día de la situación dramática. Las empresas de todos los tamaños y sectores de todo el continente están luchando para tratar de sobrevivir, buscando cómo asegurar la continuidad de sus negocios y sostenerlos pues su trabajo, es verdad. Y esto se percibe directamente eh, y esta imagen, aunque se ve todos los días en la calle con comercios cerrados, con algunas excepciones, es un reflejo de una situación insostenible, tanto para los empresarios como para los trabajadores. Obviamente, our tourism industry has been severely hit by the pandemic, with almost 90% of our workers being laid off. Social dialogue with our tripartite partners to ensure the industrial harmony is maintained and no one is unfairly treated at the center of our response as we gradually ease into maintaining a balance between health and wellness and economic recovery and economic stability. All deemed essential workers, grocery store clerks, healthcare workers, food processing workers, truck drivers, transit workers, even migrant workers and temporary foreign workers were deemed um, essential. All of these are 
the positions that struggle. Uh, most of them are part-time contractual minimum wage conditions with very, very few protections. And they all became our COVID heroes. Seguramente la crisis más mayor de los últimos 100 años, eh, como se ha comentado en los paneles anteriores, eh, hemos tenido pérdidas de empleo de manera importante, cierres de empresas, caídas en las ventas, un aumento muy importante en la informalidad, tal como se planteaba en el panel anterior, un riesgo también, como lo ha dicho la propia OIT, de que aumente, por ejemplo, el trabajo infantil y de que haya baja en la tasa de participación de ciertos sectores relevantes de nuestra economía, al menos en el caso de Chile, hemos visto ya producto de esta pandemia una baja importante en la participación de mujeres y de jóvenes. Con la pandemia prácticamente se hizo a la luz pública todas las debilidades que tenemos nosotros, todas las situaciones que se poseen en un país como el nuestro y por eso hoy tenemos unos números totalmente diferentes. Encontramos que hemos perdido cerca de 4 o 5 millones de empleos, unos formales, otros informales. Companies of all sizes, from all sectors and industries, across the Americas and around the world, are struggling tremendously for business continuity and for survival. Companies across the board are facing liquidity problems and they're at risk of permanent closure. Some sectors have been severely impacted by the pandemic, resulting in staggering erosion of the economy and of markets, both locally and internationally. In particular, SMEs, which are the backbones of most economies, are suffering the most. Medidas tomadas. La verdad es que la recuperación va a tardar, va a ser larga. Por lo tanto, tenemos que rescatar la estructura productiva y eso nos va a ayudar a compensar en cierta medida si se logra rescatar la estructura productiva de las microempresas, de las pequeñas y medianas empresas. Esto va a ayudar sin duda también a proteger el empleo por un lado y por otro a, a no tener una caída tan fuerte en términos de ingresos. A nosotros en Costa Rica esta emergencia nos toma con cifras de desempleo superiores al 12% y con una informalidad cercana al 46%. También con una economía altamente vinculada a los mercados internacionales, pero con una ventaja muy importante. La ventaja de tener un sistema de seguridad social y una, una protección eh, sanitaria bastante, cobertura eh, bastante extendida a lo largo y ancho del país y eso realmente se ha convertido en uno de los pilares más importantes para poder enfrentar esta emergencia. Argentina ha prohibido los despidos. La Argentina ha prohibido los despidos y las suspensiones por falta de trabajo o fuerza mayor y solo admitió las suspensiones con acuerdo de los sindicatos y pago de compensaciones remuneratorias. Al igual que el resto de los países, eh, lo que establecimos, lo que las decisiones fueron, protejamos al trabajo y las unidades productivas. Hemos tenido que implementar medidas eh, con mucha velocidad, a, casi al ritmo de la crisis y el impacto que ha venido ejerciendo sobre nuestras economías, comprometiendo eh, desde el primer momento recursos del Estado para eh, paliar o mitigar los efectos de esta pandemia en términos no solo sanitarios, sino también de carácter económico. Nuestra estrategia fue eh, desarrollada para, para producir efectos en, en, tres, en tres puntas, ¿no? eh, en las, eh, para proteger las empresas, los empleos y, y claramente la renta también de los trabajadores. The heroes in this crisis are women. Women make up the majority of workers in care work uh, and essential services. Many are also migrants. And while they are considered heroes or essential, they are still having to deal with low wages, poor working conditions, um, and a burden, again, as I indicated earlier, of uh, unpaid work. Over the past few months, the United States has waged an all-out war against COVID-19, which is through unprecedented measures to provide relief to our economy and to help return our workers to safe, healthy jobs. Our guidelines for opening up America again provide a three-phased uh, approach to restoring our economy and labor markets. Based on the advice of public health experts, and the approach builds upon four fundamental principles. The use of up-to-date data, mitigation of risk of resurgence, protection of the most vulnerable, and implementation as needed on statewide or country-by-country -country basis at governor's discretion.
salud y seguridad en el trabajo. Desde el principio, el foco de atención en Costa Rica han sido las personas desde la perspectiva sanitaria, el empleo y por supuesto las empresas. Eso quiere decir que nuestros objetivos eran evitar al máximo que perdiéramos vidas, evitar la destrucción de los puestos de trabajo y evitar la pérdida de empresas. Tenemos una alianza muy fuerte con el Ministerio de Salud, la Caja de Seguro Social y nuestra Dirección de Inspecciones para poder en este proceso asegurar que los trabajadores tengan el entorno suficientemente claro, seguro, para poder que retornen a sus trabajos y que esto sea la garantía de que nosotros podamos seguir trabajando como gobierno en eh, la reapertura y la dinamización de, de la economía. Bien, hemos adoptado una política de seguridad y salud ocupacional por demás importante, porque esta cuarentena inteligente de hecho está basada en, la, en el funcionamiento y éxito de las normas de seguridad en el trabajo y de ese modo COVID de vivir y trabajar, para lo cual hemos fortalecido todo nuestro sistema de inspección. Ante esta inédita experiencia, es importante priorizar, garantizar las condiciones de salud, seguridad en el lugar de trabajo, durante los traslados, tanto para quienes que están en la primera línea como para quienes comienzan a regresar paulatinamente a las actividades en las distintas etapas de apertura. Informalidad. Nos golpea en la cabeza la desigualdad. O sea, no es que no existía, sino que el virus lo que ha venido a hacer es pegarnos la desigualdad en la frente y mostrarnos que mientras no resolvamos el tema de la desigualdad, vamos a tener problemas con el diseño de herramientas para atender a la población y resolver sus problemas. Por eso creo que la agenda de la OIT en materia de trabajo digno y reducción de las desigualdades hay que fortalecerla más que nunca. Y sabemos eh, de memoria que la informalidad es una de las más pesadas cargas para el desarrollo latinoamericano. Y ahora vamos a tener empresas cerrando y la informalidad aumentando mucho. Entonces ni los millones de microempresarios ni los millones de trabajadores por cuenta propia eh, van a tener espacio sino con una visión de mediano y largo plazo como una oportunidad de diseñar una estrategia uh, para disminuir la informalidad. La informalidad ha postrado en la pobreza a muchas familias en esta crisis sanitaria y los subsidios que el Estado está eh, proveyendo sin duda son un paliativo, pero no resuelven ni en el corto plazo ni en el mediano plazo la situación de vulnerabilidad en la que se encuentran. Entonces, implementar, trabajar un mecanismo de protección social que garantice ingresos sobre todo a las familias más pobres en situaciones como las que estamos atravesando es el desafío mayor. We must find innovative ways to overcome informality which hinders our social and economic development. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye to this issue. The current pandemic has illustrated to us that health and social security systems are at the brink of collapse because they do not have enough resources to cover the needs of those who are not in the system. It's important that the transfer of the informality to the formality is with a decent work. It's not sufficient to make the formalization of the work by the law. Pudimos instalar desde Panamá una mesa de diálogo eh, que para nosotros fue muy importante precisamente el primero de mayo porque la instala el presidente de la república, la organización internacional de trabajo eh, fue importante en la participación de este diálogo, fue observador pero también nos ayudó mucho en el proceso con su apoyo técnico. Eh, lo más importante es producir un acuerdo nacional donde los trabajadores, nuestros empleadores, y, y el gobierno nacional, o sea, de una forma tripartita, presentemos a nuestros ciudadanos un acuerdo en esa misma línea. Que esta situación que estamos viviendo la volvamos fuerza. Al diálogo social, más que nunca, ese trabajo tripartito nos está sirviendo para ser más innovadores, por supuesto, construir nuevas eh, respuestas desde el sector y desde la mirada específica de los trabajadores y de los empleadores. Nosotros apuntamos a que el diálogo social se vuelva un instrumento que dé creatividad y productividad a lo que nos viene. Formación profesional y teletrabajo. 
the pandemic has changed our views on a whole number of things. And being strategic about future jobs is something that we need to consider. I spoke earlier about training and retraining of our people. And we're actually at the moment working quite closely with the ILO and Mr. Panero, thank you very much, and his team. We are working on what is called an employability project. And uh, that is a project essentially to reskill and to retool and to, to, to make our people, our workers, better than they were before. We need to provide education and training to equip our population for the digital economy. We need to provide them with current and future types of infrastructure along the information highway to ensure that they can be provided with opportunities to exploit the new shift in how the world would work in the new future. Skilling and preparing workers for new opportunities is a fundamental investment, and this will help us to better be prepared to create a better normal that we want to see. Equally important, uh, several countries have started doing this uh, in order to be prepared for the new forms of employment. And countries started the regulating of the teleworking. Una nueva y mejor normalidad. Y esto también nos da la oportunidad de generar nuevos y mejores empleos para así reemplazar los que se han perdido y también reducir la desigualdad en nuestros países. Y para hacerlo, necesitamos un nuevo pacto social que reduzca las brechas entre los que viven en la ciudad y los que viven en el campo, entre los conectados y los desconectados, y entre los que tienen empleos formales y los que tienen empleos informales. ¿Cómo nos adaptamos a una reestructura del mercado de trabajo que va a ser muy profunda, muy rápida, porque el que piense que este, el mercado de empleo eh, entró en un freezer mientras dura la pandemia y luego sale intocado, se equivoca, ¿no es cierto? Tenemos un gran cambio estructural al que hay que adaptarse con una velocidad inesperada. La pregunta que debemos contestar muy claramente es ¿qué estamos haciendo ahora para una nueva normalidad, para una mejor normalidad? Nosotros desde la CSA presentamos como propuesta la plata, la Plataforma de Desarrollo de las Américas, como nuestra contribución para el desarrollo sustentable. Para una nueva y mejor normalidad defendemos que en América que la producción y el empleo estén en el centro de un modelo económico con respecto al medio ambiente, que podamos debatir un modelo de consumo con seguridad y soberanía alimentar, que tengamos una región de libertades donde combatimos el machismo, el patriarcado, sin violencia contra las mujeres, donde respetemos a los pueblos indígenas, sin racismo, Black Lives Matter, vidas negras importa, donde defendemos los derechos de las personas LGTBI+, y las libertades en general. Claramente esta es una crisis lamentable y sumamente desafiante, pero que también nos genera grandes oportunidades de transformación en nuestros países, precisamente comprendiendo los problemas y las brechas que tenemos. El desafío ahora es cómo traducir eh, esta bien hecha manutención de, empre de empleos en una retomada más rápida y que permita eh, la, la continuación de la economía y de la renta de los trabajadores. In our view, the crisis has demonstrated to us how significant economic activity is for the well-being of nations. The private sector is a key actor in generating productive employment that drives social and democratic stability in all the countries. It is private enterprises ranging from the small corner shop to the big multinational country companies that exist throughout the Americas and the world that can create the jobs needed. Queremos un mundo mejor después después de la pandemia, pero para que este mundo se quede mejor después de la pandemia, hay que enfrentar cuestiones que nosotros no vamos, no vamos, no estamos enfrentando a muchos años. And if we really care about decent work, we have to find a way to bring people out of the informal economy, which is where the biggest risk for decent work deficits exist, and find ways, and this is through government policy, to incentivize them to come into the formal sector. Tenemos tres frentes, uno para el año 2030, que es el cumplimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, y todos estos indicadores 
nos están retrocediendo frente a las metas que teníamos como objetivo. Entonces, tenemos que recuperar esa senda. Segundo, tenemos que tomar la declaración de Panamá, como ya lo mencionó de Gabriela, una de mis colegas, y al mismo tiempo alinear la declaración del centenario, en donde enfatizan los elementos sustanciales, que no quiero en este momento extender, pero que son elemento clave para definir la política de OIT en el marco de acción de los próximos meses y años. Si nos quedamos con los brazos cruzados, esta crisis concentrará más la economía, aumentará el desempleo, la precarización laboral y profundizará aún más los índices de pobreza y desigualdad en la región. We must also look at the long term picture, which will be very critical. How can we use this to fix some of the underlying challenges that already exist before the crisis? Equally, diversification of economies must now become a major priority. We need to look at emerging sectors and value chains and ensure there is access to credit and finance to activate or reactivate these sectors as needed. There is also scope for creating more green and blue jobs in our response. was that the glass is half full, not half empty, uh, in the consequence uh, of the last couple of words. Um, adapt and mitigate, uh, a very important challenge, um, but there are opportunities on the horizon. The question is, of course, how to get there. And uh, everybody was also very realistic that it's not going to be sort of like happening next year. Vinicius, what were the key takeaways for you and maybe also the pathway to the future? Eh, gracias, eh, eh, Connie. Bueno, como ha mencionado el director general al inicio de, este, de esta jornada, eh, partimos todos de condiciones iniciales distintas. ¿no? La crisis ha, ha llegado, eh, eh, hemos visto en América Latina este tsunami venido desde, desde Asia, pasando por Europa, y América del Norte, y ahora llegando a América del Sur. Y ahora estamos en el epicentro de la, de la pandemia. Y, y, y en nuestro caso, las condiciones estructurales han sido una barrera, ¿no? una respuesta más, efe, más efectiva de, de, de lo que se ha hecho hasta ahora, ¿no? en especial el alto nivel de informalidad, ¿no? eh, en especial la baja capacidad fiscal que tenían los estados eh, en la región. ¿no? Y en tercer lugar, la debilidad en los sistemas de protección social eh, en los países, eh, en muchos países de América Latina. Entonces, esos tres elementos fueron una barrera para que la, la por, para que la respuesta fuera más eh, efectiva. ¿no? En muchos casos, eh, el confinamiento eh, resultó eh, muy difícil, ¿no? en especial en países eh, que experimentan altos niveles de informalidad. Así que eh, este es un mensaje muy claro. ¿no? Y, 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 y un punto que me pareció fundamental en la discusión fue los países que tenían ya eh, eh, un, un, un sistema de desarrollo, de desarrollo social más desarrollado o más efectivo en términos también de respuestas al empleo, como Costa Rica, lograron tener eh, 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 respuestas eh, más efectivas, ¿no? e impactos más efectivos, tanto en el control de la pandemia como también con respecto a la reactivación económica. ¿no? Así que muchos de los ministros, eh, de los mandantes, de los actores sociales, se están preguntando, ¿no? ¿por qué es que nos falta? ¿no? ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué es que nos faltó en este momento que, que pudiéramos haber hecho quizás antes y que nos resultaría mejor? Eh, está en una mejor situación en este momento. Por ejemplo, eh, seguro desempleo. ¿no? Seguro desempleo existe solamente en seis países de la región, quizás sea el momento de considerarse una ampliación o la implementación y la ampliación de los sistemas de seguro desempleo. La formalización, por supuesto, eh, es un desafío estructural de décadas, ¿no? que ahora se torna más prominente, un reto estructural de décadas, que ahora se trata, se trata más fundamental que todo. ¿no? La adaptación de los sistemas de seguridad y salud de trabajo es otra medida que es fundamental. El fortalecimiento de la, de la protección social y, y, y el fortalecimiento de, de la formación eh, profesional, en especial para la reactivación y para la transformación productiva de largo plazo. Esos son los elementos que salieron eh, eh, en este menú de opciones, de, de qué nos falta ¿no? con, con respecto a la, a la respuesta al COVID. Eh, un otro punto que me parece fundamental, y eso han resaltado varios eh, ponentes, es que la crisis no puede ser una excusa 
para bajar el nivel de protección, para bajar el nivel eh, de, de, de los derechos laborales. ¿no? Así que, eh, muy buena noticia que aparte de lo que está pasando, la, mala, la, la, la negatividad de la crisis, dos países de la región han ratificado convenios de la OIT. En México, la semana pasada, el convenio 189, ¿no? de protección de los trabajadores domésticos, y, y Uruguay, eh, eh, el 190, ¿no? de bienes contra las mujeres. Así que las normas internacionales tienen que ser la, la base ¿no? para la respuesta. Eh, un, un tercer punto tiene que ver con los grupos vulnerables, como mencioné anteriormente, ¿no? la respuesta tiene que, como el impacto es desproporcional, la respuesta también tiene que ser desproporcional eh, con respecto a la protección de los grupos vulnerables. Todo eso tiene que apuntar a una eh, transformación productiva, o sea, ¿no? tenemos que aprovechar esta crisis y transformarla en una oportunidad para repensar eh, eh, nuestro, eh, la, nuestras estructuras ¿no? productivas de cada país, y ahí por ejemplo los caribeños están preguntándose, ¿no? Por si deberíamos no estar tan dependiente de, 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 de turismo, quizás empezar a de desarrollar eh, otras áreas más relacionadas con la economía eh, digital y otros países lo mismo, ¿no? Y el rol que tiene la formación profesional en esto, ¿no? Para que se estimule eh, a, eh, más productividad, más formalización, eh, y ahí también eh, hay un espacio importante para mejorías en, la, en, la, en las legislaciones con respecto al teletrabajo, con respecto a la protección de trabajadores de plataformas, así que se abre un nuevo flanco, ¿no? un nuevo, se abren nuevas oportunidades y, y, y es fundamental apostar en eso y en especial contar con la, con la innovación, con la creatividad, con la capacidad de resiliencia del sector privado, ¿no? crear ambientes favorables para que las empresas puedan ajustarse, ¿no? y eso es el caso de Diego, ahí, el peruano, del primer del primero bloque, ¿no? que justamente tuvo una idea y, 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 y al final le resultó muy bien, ¿no? porque pues, logró mover su, su modelo de negocio hasta, la, hasta el mundo virtual y lo está haciendo muy bien. Eh, el tema de, la, de, la, de las mejorías institucionales, ¿no? muchos eh, ministerios, eh, entidades gubernamentales y de trabajo tienen que operar ahora en el mundo virtual, así que también es importante. El diálogo social es, es la clave y eso, has, eh, eh, pa, venimos de una situación en que todo tiene que ser, muchos eh, resaltaron la necesidad de acuerdos, de pactos, eh, de que tanto la reactivación como la pensar el futuro tiene que ser negociado, ¿no? porque al final es algo que nos va a tocar a todos, ¿no? es necesario que sea eh, eh, sostenible. Y finalmente, eh, un llamado muy fuerte eh, a la OIT, a la OIT como organización ¿no? tripartita para que asuma su responsabilidad, su rol en este proceso. ¿no? Porque eh, fíjese, eh, Connie, que la, la última pandemia que tuvimos fue justamente la vida española, que fue en 1918, en 1919 fue creada la OIT. Es como una ironía que justamente el primer reto para la OIT de su segundo centenario sea esta pandemia. ¿no? Entonces es una oportunidad para que la OIT demuestre su valor, su relevancia ¿no? y trabaje eh, 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 por intermedio de sus instrumentos eh, para que superemos esta pandemia y que creemos una nueva y mejor normalidad. Así que muchas gracias. Initiative, uh, thank you very much for, your base for taking us uh, a step ahead, uh, the look into the future with uh, Vinicio Spiniero, the ALO Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. We have uh, come to an end of our journey around the ILO world. We have covered uh, all the regional events uh, that happened last week. Uh, we've had the 20 minute excerpts uh, of each of the event and now I'm very happy to say I can say uh, hello back again Guy Ryder. Um, uh, of course you never left the building but uh, you may have left that particular spot so um, uh, I'm sure that you listened in on uh, some of the remarks uh, that you had heard and of course um, the ILO world is very diversified. Um, different issues, different problems, different stages also in this COVID-19 crisis of actually fighting the health issue um, at hand. And uh, I think I just looked up, uh, it's 11 and a half billion people uh, that have been infected as of yesterday, yeah. um, and we're still not at an end. So. Um, what's your takeaway right now? What is your reaction to what you've heard and the outlook? Well, thanks, Connie. Yes, I've been sitting here listening throughout uh, uh, the event that's taken place. And the first thing I want to do 
is to thank you for guiding us through this rather complex journey, global journey, uh, so skillfully. Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely rich and wealth, uh, wealth of issues come out of this uh, global conversation. But there are two, I think, big messages which I've taken um, away from what I've heard from these reports back from the regional events. The first, and I wonder if you've got the same impression, it's subjective, but it's important. And that is just how much determination, engagement, just how many ideas we've heard from ministers, from workers, from employers. This type of engagement, yes, it's a subjective element, but it's the absolute precondition of getting things done. You don't hear any fatalism here. You don't hear any resignation. Uh, people are determined, uh, despite the, uh, the severity of the crisis that we're facing, to look together uh, for solutions. And I think this is the essential starting point for our efforts. So I'm enormously encouraged uh, by that. The second thing, and it's slightly more complex, but it's equally as important, is you know, people are defining our objectives here not by reference to the past, but by reference to the future. What do I mean by that? I mean that we're not simply trying to get out of this pandemic by going back to where we started from. Our eyes are firmly fixed on the future. And that's why our centenary declaration that we adopted last year is so important. A centenary declaration, let me remind everybody, uh, for the future of work. So I've heard many people saying from all sides, government, employers and workers, that if there is an opportunity in this pandemic, and I feel somewhat uncomfortable talking about opportunity, it is that this pandemic has laid bare. None of us can ignore it. None of us can say we cannot see it. Some of the gross injustices and past policy failures that are affecting the world of work. Uh, I'll give you the two examples which came out again and again with the greatest clarity. Uh, our failure uh, to provide even the basics of social protection to the majority of, of the working people of the world, which have left so many in a desperate situation. And secondly, the fact that despite our talking about it for very many decades, we still have impossibly high levels of informality in the world, six out of 10 workers. And again, that's left people in a dramatically uh, vulnerable situation. So we don't want to get back there. We want to do better than that. And that is why the new normal we're looking for has to be a better normal. And we've got some great ideas of where we're going in that regard. Uh, already the Centenary Declaration has said, no, we have to prepare the world of work to deal with the, the transitions which were always ahead of us, even before the pandemic struck. Uh, the ecological transition, the digital transition, the demographic transitions that were before us. We need to prepare people's capacity, their skills. We need to invest in the jobs of the future. And we need to invest in those institutions, make them solid enough to resist the type of shock that this pandemic has presented us with. So all of these messages came across, I think, with the greatest clarity. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the takeaway, i.e. what is the outlook? What are the next steps? Uh, you've mentioned the Centennial Declaration a number of times, and yes, it is uh, one more milestone, one platform to stand on, uh, but the way the path is not finished, uh, I was mentioning earlier, and of course it's a usual kind of picture, we're running a marathon. And we're not just running the COVID-19 marathon, uh, around the corner is um, the climate crisis. So um, I think um, there is quite a challenge ahead. We've got a lot of challenges ahead. You know, um, when I talk about all of the good things that came out of the regional conversations, it doesn't mean that I don't see the problems ahead and the fact that the road ahead is liable to be difficult uh, and long. And I can see some challenges coming to meet us really very, very quickly. When I say us, I mean policy makers and social partners. The first one, and it's really facing us around the world, you just have to look at the news every day. We really have to get this balance right uh, between health policy and economic and social policy. If I look out the window on my left, I see the World Health Organization building. Uh, we work together. We work together to combine and reconcile health objectives and world of work objectives. It's not an either or. So we have to make sure that when we reopen workplaces, we get people back into uh, the world of work. It has to be 
in conditions of safety. The, the dangers of a second wave, the dangers of doing things wrong, will damage both objectives if we, if we don't really get that balance correct. Secondly, we have seen around the world that governments have made enormous efforts, invested 10 trillion US dollars to stimulate the world of work, keep, keep people in work, keep enterprises going. Now that's had some consequences, done a lot of good, but we know this costs very great sums of money. These are big resources and as debt increases and governments look at their accounts, we're going to have to, they're going to have to find the space and the means to maintain that effort until we get over uh, the extraordinary challenges we have before us. I think applying the brakes of financial consolidation too early runs the risk of retarding uh, the recovery. The third challenge, and I think in some ways it's the most important of all, is that despite the amazing efforts made by some countries, uh, we haven't seen the necessary international dimension uh, to the COVID-19 response. We classically say this is a global uh, crisis which requires a global response. But the reality is countries have been reacting individually in compartments. The element of global solidarity, uh, the element of international common purpose has not been there or it's not been there uh, to the degree that it is required. So the international community does have to come together. The ILO is one venue, only one venue uh, where that can be done and must be done. And let's remember that just uh, five years ago, that international community uh, through the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda, the 2030 Agenda, committed to a series of goals that we cannot simply throw out the window now. We can't abandon them because the pandemic has set us back. We have to rededicate and bring our forces together in a truly global response. And after that, I'm just going to reiterate a couple of further points, which again came out with great clarity in the conversation. Uh, the first is, you know, in the wake of this pandemic and moving towards what must be a better normal, we have to give priority to those who are most vulnerable in the world of work, those who have been hit hardest. I think particularly of those frontline health and care workers who we all know now are absolutely essential to our well-being, but whose work is so often and so badly undervalued. It's one example of how we have to recalibrate the way we look at the world of work. And lastly, and it came out again and again and again in our regional events, dialogue, social dialogue and cooperation between governments, employers and workers. Each one has an interest to defend, legitimate interests. They don't always correspond 100%. But we know, and we have 100 years of doing this at the ILO, is where they can join forces and work out solutions together. Uh, we get out of crises that much better. And it goes without saying that at the same time that you commit to social dialogue, by definition, uh, you commit to respecting the rights of every actor in the world of work. So this has been some, I think, of the, the really strong messages that have come out of our regional events and which I think set the scene beautifully for the rest of our virtual uh, summit uh, this week. Thank you so much, Guy Ryder. Thank you so much, ILO Director General, for today, uh, tomorrow, and uh, on Wednesday and on Thursday. Uh, there are still uh, really fascinating days. Uh, I think tomorrow is absolutely amazing uh, with a lineup of organization and uh, people that you have. Uh, uh, Antonio Guterres is going to say hello and is going to contribute. You have um, heads of states, you have presidents, uh, you have prime ministers, uh, absolutely fascinating. And of course, top representatives of employers and workers. And then I think uh, you're going to be moderating on Thursday. So, um, uh, wish you good luck for yeah. that. And uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming uh, to the close of uh, today, of uh, this so-called regional day, regional day insofar as we looked at the five big regions and their 
um, events uh, that were online, that were virtual, as is this whole ILO summit this year, 2020, uh, maybe a predecessor already for the UN General Assembly, which is also going to be mostly a virtual event. Uh, we wish you um, a lot of uh, interest uh, and maybe gaining a little bit of knowledge, a bit of insight uh, watching the next two days. We hope that if you enjoyed today and um, to all of you, keep up the energy and keep up the good work. Thank you.